Commander Steel Blue. Good evening, everybody. Hey there. Hello. Sound loud and clear? Oh, good. Thank you. All right. So this is going to be our Sorcerer Build Show. Yay. You guys ready? <laughs> yeah. Well, obviously, for people who don't know anything about a Sorcerer, maybe they're coming from 5th edition, who wants to tell everyone what the cool deal with a Sorcerer is in general? I don't have to read books. <laughs> in your uh, own words, in your own words, why would anyone want to play a sorcerer? Uh, I think it it's really, I think just, you know, for a change of pace, they feel different. Um, you can be mysterious about it with your bloodline abilities. You know, play up that aspect of, you know, nobody really knows where your power comes from. Mm-hmm. Now, for people who don't know what the Bloodline abilities are, what are those? Are we talking about the same kind of Sorcerer from 5th edition and 3.5, Charisma-based, right? But they're calling it Bloodlines and Pathfinder, aren't they? Uh, essentially, yeah. Your your power comes from something that's been latent in your in your genes. You're kind of like a, a mutant. You didn't yeah. choose to become a spellcaster. You were born one, right? Pretty much. Exactly. Um, and, and the other great thing about... Um, Pathfinder 2nd Edition's Sorcerers compared to stuff like 5e and 1st Edition Pathfinder um, is the fact that there's multiple different types of them um, from from different uh, sources of, of magic. You're not just an arcane caster. You can be a cult or um, primal or even elemental, for example. Well, let's run through those divine. really, really quickly. Yeah, if I pick divine yeah, even. divine as well, yeah. So we got... That's what I went, yep. So what do we have? The... What's the first one here? Bloodline, bloodline, aberrant, Apparent. aberrant. How would you say that? What's yeah. the proper proper pronunciation for that, Egan? Uh, probably the one you gave, aberrant. Probably. Mm -hmm. There's no H in it, even though I put one in there when I first said it. <laughs> and then angelic, yeah. then yeah. De and demonic, then demonic. Yep. and then diab diabolic, <laughs> diabolic, yeah, Dracon diabolic for draconic. For and then Elemental, Fae, Hag, and Imperial, which is odd. Always made me think of Elder Scrolls Online. And then Undead. So for someone who's never played Pathfinder 2nd Edition before and isn't already a master of the rules, the themes of those different types of things, each one of us has got a cool character we're going to show today. So we've, we we kind of pick a bloodline early on. We're deciding what the character is going to be. Why don't we just start right off with one of you guys walking us through your build. And one of the first thing I'd love for you to tell us about is like, why did you pick that bloodline? versus someone else. So who wants to go first and tell me your character name? I got the sheets ready to go here really large so people can see them. I'll go first if you want. All right, which character is yours? Uh, Cadwin. All right, here we go. This is the exile from the Drow City, right? <laughs> I'm joking. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I, I, didn't, I didn't look at the other character sheets, so I thought maybe somebody did make a... Make an exile from a drow city. So. No, I'm just making a joke because a lot of the drow names always have the apostrophe, like D, D apostrophe, Ivir, you know, all these kinds of okay. things. So, no, nothing, right. no, nothing personal, nothing personal. <laughs> but it's so the the joke there is that his nickname is Cad, so Cadaver. Oh, there we go. Cool. Because I use the undead bloodline. Now, why did you uh, pick the undead bloodline? I, I thought it sounded just cool a little atypical for people that cast spells nobody really usually thinks about being like a necromancer because typically they're the bad guys so if someone's doing a character for the first time what page on the character sheet are they going to find where the uh, uh the bloodline when they get ready to find that right away where does it go in the character sheet for them that will be the second page the second page it's such a defining characteristic you think it'd be right up front on the first page right so yeah. then you have ancestry um, class uh, feats. Yeah, yeah, it's the it's the first listed class feature. But you're right. You you feel like it should be right after sorcerer. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, what I did with my sheet. There, but, yeah. Yeah, almost needs a, a special block on the front that you can proclaim loudly to the rest of the world what your attitude is, right? Yeah, you can do. You can write where the class is. Yeah, there we go. All right, 
I'll quit, ha- I'll quit yapping away. Walk us through this build, this character, what their theme was, what you were thinking. And if you want me to go to a certain point on the screen to highlight something, I can do that for you. It's all you, man. Go for it. Are we on, um, are we on Twitch again? Let's yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're live. We're live. So no profanity or, or slurs or political commentaries or diseases or anything like that are loud. Keep it clean for everybody <laughs> else out there that's still sick. It goes. I had to refresh it again. Okay, so one of the things that I really like about the way the character creation process works in Pathfinder is you're really encouraged to have a concept before you start. And the reason I think that's good for new players is because you can just ask them like what one of their favorite characters from a source of fiction might mm-hmm. be and then help them build a character that way. Uh, for this one, I, I didn't quite go that route because we had already decided we were making sorcerers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of worked backwards from the undead bloodline and decided that uh, I would make Cadwin an elf. Okay. Because he's going to be really old. Like, he's older than most normal elves are because he's got undead DNA. He he just doesn't really know it yet. So he's he's been around a long time. And, uh, you know, so he's seen some things and, and it's it's affected his his outlook on life and the way he interacts with other people. So that influenced a lot of the other choices I made, you know, as I progressed through the character creation process with him. Yeah, and if you if someone's listening or watching a video later on, the on page one ninety eight, the core cool rule book is where they kind of give you that really two one sentence theme of what the undead bloodline is, and they say a touch of undeath runs through your blood. Your family tree might contain powerful undead, like a vampire, but it doesn't mean you are a vampire. So it could be any form of undead that's interesting to you. Everything from a death knight, I guess, from fiend folio to a ghoul or whatever you wanted to be. So when you're getting ready to put put Cadwin together, what were you imagining in your mind? Um, I didn't really set on anything i just knew that at some point in his family's lineage um you know probably one of the the females was or somebody had you know become infected and then had children Mm -hmm. and you know so it's it's not something that maybe even happens with every generation you know just for whatever reason he was born with it more dominant okay cool you know so so born and he's just he's just a little different now, the elf, you have a subset here called a seer elf. Tell us about that if we've never heard of the, uh, no one knows what a seer elf is. And does that, does that come from Core Rulebook, or is that from one of the newer books they've added since release? Um, that's, in the, that's in the Core Rulebook. So that's the heritage I chose for him, which is just something that sort of defines your, your elfhood a little more. I'm going to flip over to that page real quick so people are following along. So you have Arctic elf, cavern elf. This is all like page 39 or so. Seer yeah. elf. So they're an inborn ability to detect and understand magical phenomena. You can cast a tech magic cantrip as an arcane innate spell at will. Sounds like fourth edition a little bit. Uh, the cantrip is heightened up to spell level equal half your level rounded up. That's really useful. In addition, you gain plus one circumstance bonus to checks, identify magic, decipher rifle, magical nature. So it's what you would expect for someone who's kind of like a, a seer or someone who's knowledge oriented or sees into the future. So that's pretty cool. Did, did you pick that uh, answer to for theme reasons, or did you pick it because of, like, what came with the kit? Um, well, I, I didn't like the heritages that had to do with, you know, geography. Okay. And uh, the ancient elf heritage that just gives you a multi-class dedication just didn't seem to fit with where I was going with the character. So uh, this was sort of, you know, the one that was left. All right, cool. Okay, so what did you, what'd you ones, decide so. to do from there? when you After you got that idea going, what was the next step for you? After you choose your ancestry, you choose your, your background. Mm-hmm. And in the Lost Worlds book, there's a, a background for an academic that is just basically somebody that went to college. Um, okay. So it, it played into his, you know, sort of been around and he's had time to to study and know things and you know so okay cool and for the abilities just, go ahead go ahead no you were going to ask a question i was going to ask about that and so when it comes to ability scores you're building the character you got this uh, you got your heritage you got the background you got the you know all that figured out does that when you shift it over to getting all the ability scores and start applying all your boosts and that kind of stuff or did you do something else first 
Um, typically, I go through the ancestry background and class selection, and then I have five booths at the end of that process mm -hmm. that I just spread out. So I'm, I'm not really spending them as you go as I as I get them, so to speak. I mean, your your ancestry ones happen, you know, sort of automatically, especially if you're using. I used Path Builder, mm -hmm. so it, as soon yep. as you tell it you want to be an elf, it applies certain things for you, which is nice. Oh yeah, very useful app. Too bad it's only on Android. For people who've never used it before, uh, there's an Android app called Path Builder you can get from the Google Play Store that lets you build a character and lets you see a lot of times ahead of time what some of the choices are. Because I know navigating the CRB in the beginning can be tricky. We're not we're not pimping them, but it's a useful tool. In fact, it's probably the only one really out there right now that I know of that's helpful to do that kind of stuff. Hey, us uh, non-Android users had to get a fillable PDF. <laughs> oh. So there's another one called Hero Formula. Lab that I haven't tried out, but yeah. Or Hero Lab or something like that. Is that what one you mean, or is it called Formula Lab? I think it's called Hero Lab, but I haven't even looked at it. So. Yeah. This is something I really, really wish that Paizo would just hire a programmer and a graphic artist to make, is to make their own, like, approved, clean, simple, and just make it free. And just have let people download it and use it. But Because you know, end users are, doing, are making this for them. But I'm, I'm getting off topic. Let's get back. To CAD, all right? You tell us more about him when you're building sure. this guy. You know, so again, I, I just decided that he would be um, really old, and he's seen some things. Um, you know, and, and most of the, the real hard decisions I had to make were, were not necessarily going to be around, you know, how he functions as a sorcerer. That sort of just happens organically as you level up. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a few things that I, I really liked about um, history of the elves as far as that they live so much longer than everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that it, it played more into the ancestry feats that I chose more than anything else. Okay. Like low light so vision. See and, there, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that comes automatically when you're an elf. But, yeah. So elven verve um, is where you have um, some extra immunities to certain effects. Um, typically associated with with undead monsters, and I don't have that book in front of me right now. That came out of the books too. So, and what about this ageless patience, appropriately well, named that, for an old elf? That's a that's an interesting one. If you are performing a task, you can take twice as long uh, to get a bonus on it, of plus two. Oh, okay. Let's think of a gameplay example of that. Um, well, the one that they used in the book, just as a quick example, was uh, seek. So if you oh sure okay two, if you use two actions to seek, then you can get a plus two bonus on it. But it's it's something that situationally is gonna you know you're gonna have to work with your DM a little bit because mm -hmm. you know a lot of times unless it's an attack action or or you know a medicine check or something like that, nobody's really thinking about how long things take. And you know what it's like when you're playing, you've got a series of players, the DM knows there's something hidden in the area, and you're hoping the players will find that secret door or find that thing hiding in the box or in the crate, and you hope they search for it, and then they don't find it, and you kind of wish they would. Having that ageless patience would be, if you're the kind of person who, and it's like we call them a, a completionist in the video game industry, find everything, that would be oh, very yeah, useful yeah. to go in the room and start searching Tomb of Horror style and find everything cool that's hidden away. So for someone who likes to play that way, that would be a great like non-combat, you know, exploration mode type thing to pick up if you're an elf. That's a cool one. I like that one. Super useful. Uh, I, I thought it fit, you know, for for what I was thinking about for this guy. He's he's just not really rushed. Does he look like Sean Connery in The Name of the Rose? <laughs> uh well, no. <laughs> I mean, I guess he he just looks, you know, like a. A creepy elf. A creepy know. elf. There you go. Well, you know, most people think elves are like, you know, pretty and dance around the woodland areas. Orlando and Bloom. And dance. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, and he's, you know, he he's perfectly at home sitting in a dark corner somewhere reading a book. He, you know, he's just not, you know, he's just not that. Why do I keep visualizing kind of undead rogues from World of Warcraft? I don't know why I keep thinking that. That's my damn video game heritage for you. So, I, I have, I've never played World of Warcraft. If you can oh, you're fortunate. 
Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I thought I was going to catch some ridicule for that, but apparently I'm, I'm lucky. Nah, it doesn't matter. Story. You can do whatever. <laughs> so you got this, your serial elf, you got Elven Verb. Now, what does Elven Verb do? What sounds like the name of a goofy band I'm not a big fan of, but uh, what does that one do? It's just a first level feat for the. What, do you remember what that uh, one does? I can grab my phone and check it, but I didn't have the book here sitting in front of me. A lot of times you have the titles of some of those feats and you think it means one thing and then you look it up and wait, well, actually, it's a little bit different than what you thought it was going to be. Well, I mean, I or it has conditions it for... that limit it. <laughs> yeah, that make it not as useful. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I picked it deliberately for, for what it did. So, um, I, It gives you a plus one circumstance bonus to saves against effects that would impose the immobilized, paralyzed, or slowed conditions. Oh, okay, so no CC, no one's going to root you in place, and you're going to get caught in an entangle or any of that kind of stuff. So you'll be able to move I, around freely or get a bonus it, it to it. It plays off of the fact that uh, the elves are immune to the paralyzing touch of ghouls. So again, I, that undead nature of his mm -hmm. physiology, I felt like it was a, a good fit. Maybe not powerful. I mean, it, a lot of things in this game are situational. When they come up, they're really cool because they work. Yeah. Um, and then if and then if they never come up, then you know it's something that you know you could have picked something else. But cool. It also reduces the duration of those effects if they do happen to stick on you. So that's a yeah. Little, and if you're a sorcerer, monster. that's uh all heavy spell oriented not picking up a bunch of armor proficiency you don't want to get hit so that'll, that'll give you a nice escape mechanic if, if it pays off for you find the treasure find the hidden room better than anyone but don't open the door <laughs> so what what were you thinking of next did you dive into start picking spells or did you go back and finish all do you want to run through the ability score boost so why you because you spread them around relatively evenly with intelligent wisdom and charisma being pretty strong a little bit of dex in there for, probably for some armor or do you want to go over skills? What do you want to talk about next? Um, well, I, I didn't do spells until the very end. Okay. Um, but there there aren't that many more choices that you make for, before I got to that point. So probably, again, the significant choice I made as far as the concept of the character was when I got another ancestry feed, I took Forlorn. So. Now, where is that on this sheet? With my con it's a... Uh... There we go. Ancestral Paragon. Forlorn, there we go. Bonus feed. So just threw it into the bonus. This is from the app. This is an output from the app. So the app's throwing it down yep. here at the very bottom. Okay. Yeah. So um, Forlorn basically is just that because he's lived so long and he's seen so many people that he's formed bond with, bonds with died, that he's uh, he's a little emotionally dead inside, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah, We're stoic it gives about you it. A, it gives you, yeah, it gives you a plus one circumstance bonus to saving throws that would affect your emotional state. Okay, cool. And if you if you roll a success, it's a, or, or whatever you roll, it's treated one category better. So basically, he can't critically fail. That's great. One of those checks. So, and again, it just fits with that whole. He's lived so long, and and he, he doesn't even really make friends anymore because they're they're just gonna die. Yeah, he's, he's gonna he's, love them. He's just tired. He's just tired of it. So I feel that way sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so what else you got here? What do you want to go over next? Um, we can we can just go straight to spells. I mean, most of the rest of it is basically built around what a sorcerer does. Sure. You know, in encounter mode, so I mean the 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 undead bloodline gives me some some cool things that happened around uh, damage dealing spells. Now, did you pick any feats to help boost your range and stuff like that? I know I did that on uh, the character I built. Did you pick um, any of your feats from the perspective of usability in combat? I did, but not range. Okay. So da Dangerous Sorcery gives you a bonus to damage with damage-dealing spells. Good. That's awesome. Cool. And signature spells, that comes with the kit, doesn't it? That's right in the core yeah. rulebook, um, and it's a status bonus to the damage equal to the level of the spell. So, Does Divine Evolution allow you to pick something from the Divine Tree? What does that one do? I'm trying to remember from memory because I didn't memorize the full Sorcerer, this level 4 feat, the 4th feat. I already have uh, Divine Spells because of my Undead Blood Rock. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I've never built an Undead one. Oh, that's cool. And Magical Fortitude, I think all Sorks get that by default at 5, don't they? 
Yeah. I guess. Yeah, that's a, a cloud, default the cloud gimme. feature. Do so you wanna... Divine Evolution says, uh, the Divine Might provided by your bloodline flows through you. You gain an additional spell slot of your highest level, which you can use only to cast your choice of either heal or harm. And These which... spells using that spell slot, even if they aren't in your current repertoire. So it just gives you an extra an extra free spell, basically. Yeah, and for folks who haven't ever played D&D ever, healing is great for healing your allies, but harm's undead, and harm's good for damaging living things, but it will heal undead. So that rule's been around forever. Except it's not as nasty as it was yes. in AD&D. <laughs> in AD&D, it nice. would take away all your hit points, but 1d4 is a good way to wipe out a dragon if you got lucky. Do you want to go over your spells next? Or you want to talk about your ability score boost or your skills? You lead the way. Um, well, again, I, I spread the ability scores out. You know, I, I shot for the, you know, basically the the highest charisma I could get, but I didn't I didn't burn a boost at fifth level to make it a nineteen. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I tend to build characters that try to be well rounded. Okay. Um, you know, this system is really good at giving you an eighteen in your primary stat, which yeah, is great. Yeah, sure is. Um, and then you can you have a lot of leeway as far as what else you know you want to do with your character so you you hit it pretty much well on the nose i went with some decks for some some armor class bonus um and intelligence for for skills mm -hmm. and uh wisdom you know for for a lot of the the benefits that you get in this game it helps with your perception which helps with your initiative it helps with your will save you know so it's it's a, a good stat you know if you can afford the points in it to, yeah absolutely to do that on the right-hand side, people watch a video. I mean, he's got plus 10 to perception roll with just this uh, wisdom score of 16. He's only trained. It's not expert, master, or legendary, which doesn't happen to higher level. So if there's a roll initiative things and he rolls a 5, he's getting a 15 on that initiative roll. Isn't that right? As long as we use perception for initiative, then that's the Good role point. he'll use. Yeah, if that's the appropriate right. situation. All right. So, and, and you know, and we talked about that the other night that you can use other skills, but a lot of times you're lobbying for that with the DM. And I mm -hmm. suppose there are situations where he might say, based on the circumstances, this is what we're all rolling. But yeah, but okay. typically you're you're not going to be able to for be forced out of rolling perception um, unless it's voluntary. You know, uh, but I but I bought points in stealth just in case. Just in case. <laughs> all right. Where do you want to go next? You want to talk about skills then? You got the ability scores um, covered. Or do you want to go yeah, down to spells? We can, we can do skills because they're right on the first page there. Sure. You know, so, so you can see he has a lot of um, sort of the standard things that you would expect from a spellcaster, arcana, um, religion, because he's he's a, a divine spellcaster. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's been around and he's he has spent a lot of time around people and in cities, so he's got a nice society role there, which which will help him out in, in some circumstances. Intimidation came with the my bloodline. Um, so I guess, you know, when he's not creepy, he's scary. Mm -hmm. You know, with an intimidator plus 11, which is, you know, not crazy huge or anything, but it's it, it, that's, a, that's a pretty decent role. So when I was building the character, I didn't spend too much time thinking about, you know, of how skills would get used too much of the time. Mm -hmm. Probably the only one that I did take, you know, for, for purely mechanical reasons would be medicine. Yeah, so you can stabilize and things like that for or and treat wounds and treat disease, yeah, treat so, poison, administer first aid. Go for it. Yeah, so his role in combat is going to sort of be maybe not primarily a healer, but, but there's some ways I can do that. I mean, nowhere near as efficiently as a priest could. Um, you know, but I could be a good backup healer. You know, because I can sort of toggle my um, my necromancy spells to to do either or through an interesting feature that I picked up for being a uh, an undead sorcerer. Let me zip to that page real quick. I think it's two forty eight, so people can see that. If you have medicine in Pathfinder, is extremely helpful. So if you ha you know it's under your wisdom score, so you're playing any class with a wisdom ability score, and in this situation he's playing you know a sorcerer, which is charisma. These are actions. Each one of these pips is an action. So it's a two action to administer first aid and help someone. They get like an immunity for ten minutes, I believe, after you've done it. After you, I can't remember the exact rules. You guys have to correct me on that. Treat wounds is the one I'm thinking of. This one right here. So 
if you have a healer's toolkit with you and someone's really wounded, you can do things to heal them, or is it just to stabilize someone? You, you guys, I believe you can completely, you can heal them, can't you? The success here is 2d8 hit points, wounded conditions removed. Yeah, you can yeah. restore hit points. Yeah, there we go. But without a, without a, a skill feat associated with that, you cannot do it that in combat. You have to do that outside of combat and mm -hmm. exploration. Good. So that's really powerful when everyone's like made it through a fight and everyone's really wounded and you don't want to have to sit around and wait for some a healer to g regain spells for eight hours or, or whatever it's going to take. Right. Yeah. Although there is the risk of critically failing and hurting somebody. Yeah. Which is like 1d8, I think, right? Yeah. yeah it's right it only there. happens if you choose the DC 20 or higher, though, correct? Uh, um, let's not see here. I'm aware of. Oh. Yeah. You can you do the DC right. 20 check to increase it. Yeah. yeah. But even on the yeah. DC 15, you can. It's just highly improbable that you'd roll right. less than five. <laughs> That's what insurance yeah. assurance is for right there. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. All we'll right. Take so, that. so there's your skills. Okay. You want to run us through your spells? Yeah. Sorry about the scrolling here. Let's get down to that last page where all the spells are. So you got a plus 11 attack roll for your spells. Your spell DC is 21. Cantrip choices, they're not really that tricky. Most everyone's going to get some of the same things, but run us through super quickly through the, the cantrip choices because some of these are going to be repeated later on. We won't have to go through like Chill Touch three times or Divine Lance, but when you were picking the cantrips, oh, so which ones did you pick? The thing is, is because I'm a Divine Sorcerer, um, you could see very different spell lists because I have, I'm choosing from the same list that an actual cleric would choose from. But you're an undead bloodline, right? Yes. So I have access to the divine spell list, um, whereas a uh, draconic sorcerer would would have a, a be choosing from a different different set of cantrips, mm -hmm. a different set of spells. Uh, so a lot of these are necromantic, chill touch, disrupt undead. Uh, they are are pretty self explanatory. Mm -hmm. um, again, he's you know I I. I really played into the the theme here and you know he's he's not he's not throwing fireballs around or lightning bolts or, or anything like that like you know sort of some of your typical you know non-religious spellcasters he's mm -hmm. a little more i don't know he, not focused but he just he does his damage in battle a different way so yeah, you can see from all these spell choices here like spirit link and death knell false life ghoulish cravings Bind Undead, Chilling oh. Darkness. I believe Chilling Darkness is a nasty one. It's got double damage to... It has, it has a cold damage uh, and also a divine one for Celestials. Isn't that what it was? I'm trying to remember the rules on that one exactly. That sounds right. Yeah, yeah something like that. It's like a um, so many D6 for cold damage and additional if it's a Celestial. Vampiric Touch, which I love. Harm, Heightened. Wow. <laughs> so that... So this... Again, that's because of... Um the class feed I took where I get that extra slot for either harm or heal at my highest level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. So that's why that's there. Feels super yeah. offensive. You know, so, oh, it's, it's definitely super, super offensive. Uh, or actually, to, he, I can use it to heal. It's a, a bit of a tricky setup, but um, sort of two or, or three spells you see in here that, you know, you would see on a, a typical spellcaster would be uh, detect magic shield and divine lance and divine lance i think was just because i none of nothing else really particularly appealed to, to the, yeah. in the character but it's one of the few um, range you, kind of nukes that you can do as the uh, divine as i remember right. so so what you see is a lot of a lot of icky necromantic magic you know that i'm going to use to to hurt people uh for the most part. Now, are, are any of these... Uh, you don't have any range on your Vampiric Touch, so you're going to have to touch, aren't you? Um, on that one, yes. Yeah. You have to time that one perfectly. So, <laughs> one yeah. that I felt like had a little bit of range to it. But yeah. I, I'm drawing a blank on it. Cool. You know, a couple of the cool, tricksy things that I can do here is I there's a spell somewhere on here and it looks like it listed harm twice instead of um, another spell that should be there uh, but that's called uh, touch of the grave 
where I can basically toggle for magical effects whether or not somebody is considered alive or dead, or undead, I should say. What I can do is uh, target one of my allies with Touch of the Grave, and for the purposes of my spells, they're considered undead, and then I can use Harm to heal them. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I'm not even going to do a search for it. I'll just cancel that. That's interesting. So if you play that smart, you can uh, help your ally by using what normally yes. would be a negative energy type spell. Correct. Cool. What so else? You, you as want... I was... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Was a question? No, go ahead. No? Oh. Um, yeah, so that was, was one of the things that I thought was rather interesting where normally you're choosing, you know, you're choosing whether to heal or harm. I, I don't have to worry about making that choice. I just you know, apply another status to one of my allies, and then I can... Cool. You know, with a spell that normally does damage. So that was sort of one of the things that I looked at as far as his role in a, in a combat encounter. And then the other one was uh, Spirit Link, where in particular, if you have a, a very sort of tanky um, melee brawler that might be drawing a lot of aggro, I can cast Spirit Link on him and move some of my hit points to him. Oh, that's so interesting. say he's taken 15 or 20 points of damage, um, then I would I would take 15 points of damage and he would go back to full. Yeah, so like a, is, was that two actions to do that? Uh, I believe so. Is that a range on that one? Do you remember? Um, I can look it up. I, I don't that's okay. remember off the top of my head but i'm such a i'm such a pvp player that i'm always thinking about range like can i do i have to get up close to do this or can i do it from range and what's my positioning going to be yeah i can't or, ever stop thinking that way <laughs> it's a range of 30 feet oh that's good that's good you can so take a I few don't, steps forward I don't and drop it be right on top of them but i you know yeah. i can i can get there yeah it's not that that huge of a of an issue so that was was one of the things i could do where if i'm in a relatively safe space i can cast spirit link and and help somebody that's you know going to be taking more damage mm -hmm. and part of the bonuses of being an undead sorcerer is that when i cast damage dealing spells i can either do extra damage or i can give myself temporary hit points based on the level of the spell so i can pretty much every turn at this point in the game give myself somewhere in the range of one to three hit points mm -hmm. temporary hit points a turn cool you know, so that'll help offset the spirit link part where you know obviously I, i'm not going to put myself hopefully into you know into the unconscious condition yeah so but, you can kind of mitigate some of the damage you're giving up in your own health by helping an ally who really needs it that reckless you know, and if fighter I'm, in the front if out on temporary hit points or if i feel like i just need that extra one or two points of damage to take an enemy down i can i can opt to do the damage with that feature as opposed to, you know. Cool. So that's Catwin uh, Edivir. Is that how you'd pronounce his name? Yes. All right. So that's our seer elf. Who wants to go next? Can we move on to another one? Absolutely. Unless anybody has any questions or, or comments or. Yeah, let's do that too. Do you have if, any questions if, or comments? If somebody I wants to tell me I made, a mis I made a mistake, that would be great too. <laughs> Not as far as I can see. Nice. I, I have a quick question. Um, did you decide what your signature spells were going to be? Um, not. So well, that came up on Path Builder, but I couldn't. It didn't seem like it wanted to let me choose anything on that. You had to select the spell again and then mark it as a as a um, signature spell. If you yeah, we okay. use the app. It sometimes would pop up twice if you weren't. Pay it was kind of tricky for a first time user. It can be uh, not saying that you are. Okay, so it can be weird. So I have not chosen a signature spell. Now, one of you guys who knows what a signature spell is, remember you could be talking to someone watching this video who doesn't know. What does that mean for a Sork in the Pathfinder Second Edition? Okay, so um, normally with a sorcerer. Um, you only have obviously this this list of known spells, um, which is completely different to to 
other prepared casters where they have access to the whole entire spell list and they can just prepare whatever from that list per day. Now, the difference with signature spells um, is that you normally with a sorcerer, you would have to learn, um, put into your repertoire, the exact level of spell that you wanted as well. So if it was a heightened version, for example, uh, like you had your, your heightened harm spell. Now, I know you got that from, obviously, your, your, your blood had that as, uh, prepared that as a sorcerer normally. Um, obviously, you would have had to take that as one of your um, spells that you put into your repertoire when you were leveling up um, as a third level, one of your third level ones that you'd learn as a heightened spell. But if it was a signature, you don't have to. Um, you just need that higher spell slot available, and then you can just automatically heighten it on cool. the fly. Cool. I think your headset came unplugged. <laughs> yeah, a little bit did. There, yeah. <laughs> Good on prov improvisational performance skill, right? <laughs> yeah, there we go. There you go. Cool. Any other questions and feedback for, for Cadwin's, uh I like your theme, to tell you the truth, just from a personal perspective. I like how you embrace the theme all the way through. It's not just some I, I power really like gamer to do character. That when I, I, I really like to do that when I make characters where I, I, I yeah. focus on a... Uh, especially you know, Gaulish a... Cravings. Like, that's such a nasty fate for somebody. Well, let's look that up real quick. Let's see here. You infect a creature with ghoul fever. I, I remember one of the first ever sessions that I, I um, GM'd for Pathfinder 2nd Edition back when it was still the playtest. Um, and I used Ghoul Fever um, on, on some of my uh, players. Um, and we had a bit of a, a Walking Dead scenario where uh, they decided to uh, chop off his arm from, from the elbow from where he'd been bitten to try and stop the infection. <laughs> um he, he he did manage to survive. He didn't become a ghoul, but it, it led to that interesting bit of roleplay where they, they heated up a knife and chopped off his arm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Cauterize so the wound one, before he doesn't bleed one out. Arm, One-armed wizard. Um. <laughs> it sounds like a bad yeah. an enemy from the uh, that Harrison Ford movie. What was it? He was a one-armed man. <laughs> the oh, Fugitive. Yeah. The Fugitive, yeah. yeah old school. <laughs> Han Solo playing a bad guy. Um, any other uh, questions well, or feedback on uh, on this guy, on Cadwin? All right. He's a cool character. I Like I said earlier, and I'm repeating myself, I still think, I think the thing you did here that's really cool is this isn't a power gamer character, but it's a character that's totally embraced into the entire theme and really making sure that his actions on the table and the things he's doing is that character, you know, and the way he would do it, the way the character would do it, not the way you as a person want to do it. And so that that's really interesting, really creative. And also well-balanced and a little bit of teamwork going on in there too. This isn't just someone who wants to run, just blow everyone up and just nuke everyone all the time. He's got all kinds of interesting elements to it. I also like how you picked all the academic seer, you know, seeing people live your whole life, the forlorn, like all those elements. That's like a character from a book. And I think that's one of the things about, second edition is that's really strong is you can actually create like you mentioned in the beginning you know draw inspiration from fiction you can create an interesting character that has flaws and all kinds of things about it so that's really awesome i love i think he's great we just need a cool piece of concept yeah. art now <laughs> yeah that that would be perfect um and oh, I totally if, if i if i draw it it would just be a stick figure so <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just one of the things that i i absolutely love about pathfinder second edition is the fact that it is so easy to make the choices as the character because you are building them sort of step by step from their origins and making those choices almost you know as, as you're going through their life rather than going well here's my class what suits that it's here's my character and like what bits of their life am i going to choose for them that makes sense for them and, and their end sort of like person that you know they're going to be because you've got it in your mind's eye yeah yeah cool i love it i liked not rolling for stats that was nice oh yeah good yeah. lord yeah and 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 always getting the max for your hit points that's nice too absolutely <laughs> i house ruled yes. that 40 years ago <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so who wants to go next who's next who's next don't be shy 
I can go next. All right, which one is yours? Um, it was the one just labeled Sorcerer. Gishkin uh, Swift original. Claw. <laughs> yes, very original. The first name is actually from the Lost Omens character guide, and I thought it was hilarious because he is kind of a Gish character, um, and we'll find out why soon. Um, so I can talk to, about the concept first, if that's all right. Yeah, go for it. All right, so when I was thinking about what I wanted to make, I wanted to have an entire story kind of play out, and I kind of found a character that could either be introduced at level one, or if it was someone that wanted to join the group later on, it could work just as well. Um, so Gish Kim, when he was still an egg, he's a lizard folk, when he was still an egg, a green hag came to his tribe and kind of cursed the tribe. And so all of the hatchlings, all the lizard folk born that year, had this hag bloodline, and they're all sorcerers. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Uh, and I kind of leaned into, like, sorceries, yes, they can have a parent, you know, from the past who, you know, it was either undead or, you know, holy or an angel or stuff like that. It can also come from, like, curses, exposure to magic. You could have been thrown into, like, another elemental plane and come back with the ability to cast spells from that energy. And so I really wanted to lean into... Like, oh, well, it's not like you just had a really powerful parent. Um, so that was Gishkim's story. But he didn't really like the magic. He didn't really like his magic. And so he didn't take a lot of class feats from Sorcerer. He actually multi-classed into Ranger. Oh, wow, that's kind of crazy. All right. Well, I got your sheet up here. Why don't you walk us through your choices then? So I guess that Scout one's one of the first ones right out the way with the background. But I'll let you yeah, dri I'll so, drive. You'll drive. You talk. You tell us. All right. OK. Yeah, I chose Scout because I wanted Gishkim, even though he had the magic, I wanted him to be more of a traditional lizard folk. I wanted him to be a lot more with the tribe. And what would he do as a lizard folk in the day to day? And so like his spells would augment his ability to scout out, you know, ahead because with his hag bloodline, he cast from the occult spell list, not from arcane or divine. Um, and so I wanted to be able to lean into that as far as what his tribe would see his role as. Um, so I decided to choose Scout. Um, it also had the ability scores that I had wanted, um, and so I really uh, went into that one. Cool. What's the next choice you made when you designed this guy? So I wanted to find um, a heritage that fit with him, and so I was trying to figure out what fit well mechanically, but also with his storyline. Um, the Unseen Lizard folk can basically camouflage themselves. They can change the color of their scales over the course of either a few minutes or up to an hour. And if you if your coloration matches the foliage or your surroundings, then you get a bonus to stealth checks, which is really nice. And that happens in real life in my garden this afternoon. <laughs> We're here in the States. We have these little, we call them chameleons as little kids, as these little lizards, they can go green or brown. They'll change their colors based on what their surroundings are. So that's really cool. Do you all have those in the UK? Um, not really. Um, uh, it's not really warm enough here for, for that. I mean, obviously we have them in like, you know, animal shops or, or zoos and stuff. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, not, not in the wild, no. So the Unseen Wizard, uh, Lizard Folk, that's not in CRB, is it? That's in one of the other books? Uh, yeah, so that's... the Lizard Folk is a ancestry from Lost Omens Character Guide. Cool. Yeah, and that came out in like, what, December of 2019? I can't remember exactly, but it came out pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, they've been churning uh, out books. Yeah, oh yeah, their publisher. <laughs> it was the the second book after the um, Lost core Omens two. Oh, okay. Great. I think it was core rulebook, and then the world guide, and then the character guide. Yeah. 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 I think uh, I think some of the young well kids wrote those the... books. I think they did a good job. They have a couple of young kids there. I've been pretty impressed with their writing. I can't remember their names, unfortunately. So okay, what else with this guy? He is cursed as an egg. Kind of a ranger vibe. Chameleon, you said you went yeah. down a scout. Tell me more. These scores that I chose, I didn't exactly choose them like based on the background, the class, and the ancestry. I really did map out like what ability scores I wanted to have by the end, and like, okay, so what's my main stat? What's my secondary? Is that going to lean into what I want him to be able to do? Does that fit with what the ancestry is going to do? And so I did go full into charisma, but then I did put dexterity as my next one because mm -hmm. I know when I'm 
uh, playing a spellcaster, the thing that I really hate is that when I've run out of spells or none of my spells are hel helpful, suddenly the only thing I can do is miss with a crossbow. Yeah. Um, so I really wanted to avoid that with this character. So I put dexterity high as well. Okay. So your range, that's how your ranged to hit or ranged damage is going to be more effective. And obviously you're, I'm just saying that for people who don't know. Right. So the range to hit is going to be more effective. And then the actual weapon that I chose allows you to add part of your strength bonus as well to tie, in, tie into the ability boost to strength that you get from being a lizard folk. Mm -hmm. So you have your claw here. It's a 1d4 damage that's using uh, dex as the damage deal. Is it like what they call it, an agile weapon? Yeah, it's a finesse weapon, so you can use okay. dex for your uh, to attack. Okay. Yeah, and they had that in 3.5, so that's not unknown to most of us. That's cool. Yeah, I'm really happy that now it's not attached to a feat. It's actually just attached to the weapon now, so I don't have to use a feat to be able to use this weapon more effectively with my dex score. Yeah, that was a feat you had to pay for in third edition of D&D, of &D, and you had to really mm -hmm. plan yeah. really far in advance and how you're going to take two-weapon fighting and advanced two-weapon fighting and space, you know, specialize in a rapier, and you're worried about the threat range and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to do that anymore. Now you're just going, hmm, do I want to trip people or do I want to pierce them? Or So the weapons are more like what's interesting about the weapon for me from a style perspective, in my opinion, as opposed to uh, what can I not do? Well, I can't do that. You know, things like a sickle are nasty now. <laughs> so Yeah. They really made sure to make sure the numbers were very tight. And so you don't have to take all these feats to, you know, remain good in your role to even keep up with everyone. Now that's all already so balanced that you can choose feats based on the flavor, based on the role playing, based on what you want to do, which is much nicer. Yeah, and I think it also encourages people who... A lot of these games, you get the power gamer kind of thing going on, which isn't necessarily bad. Some people do enjoy doing that, but it, I think that's the thing about the second edition of Pathfinder so strong is it's moved so far away from 3.5 that you can do exactly like you just said. You can design a really crazy, unique, creative character, and they're completely viable. And, and as you play on the table for a while, that's where you pick up the things that you noted a moment ago, like when my spells aren't effective, I want to be able to do something besides shoot a crossbow. So cool. What else you got on him? What else you want to cover? You want to talk about um, I want to make sure or... and talk about his feats okay, so that I that. can talk about what I did for the multi-classing. Yeah, go for it. So I decided to go multi-class into Ranger at level 2, and I really like how they do it in Pathfinder 2nd Edition because the only thing I'm missing out on is probably would have taken like Dangerous Sorcery for the damage boost at level 2 and then probably taken Occult Evolution, um, a lot like the previous Sorcerer. Um, mm -hmm. But since I decided not to do that, now I'm gaining the source of the Ranger dedication. And so since I had the deck score that I needed, suddenly I'm getting two additional skills. I'm getting the ability to hunt prey. Like I'm getting all these things that give me more to do and more interactions in fights and outside of fights. Yes, yeah, so for people who don't understand how the um, multi-classing works, they call them archetypes. And then basically the first thing you pick is it's called a dedication. So in this case, you've picked the Ranger one, which is here on 228, right? So you've got this Ranger dedication. That's what you've done with your guy, right? Mm -hmm. Requirement is dexterity of 14. So when you did your ability scores, you had to make sure you had that because you were planning ahead a little bit to be able to do that, weren't you? Yeah, and that's why I decided to make it my secondary stat. It would help with range strikes, and it was also what I needed to take the feat. Cool. Tell us more about him. Yeah, so I decided to kind of lean into the identity as a lizard folk as kind of, you know, in the tribal element, you know, they're scouting around their area, you know, for food, for enemies, for, you know, interlopers, um, because they're kind of more of a monster uh, ancestry. And so I wanted to make sure that he was good at that. And so, you know, he's trained survival and stuff like that, and in nature. And then I decided to, at fourth level to take another feat from the multi-class, which is a basic hunter's trick, mm -hmm. and basically lets me take... Um, a class feat from Ranger as long as it's first or second level. And I decided to take a feat that was going to allow me to be more consistent with hitting targets with my ranged weapon. So that way I can be a bit more consistent with my ability to do things besides spells. Did you plan that from the perspective of I'm going to run around with a weapon in my hand and, and use ranged attacks all the time and then use a sorcery? Or were you just whatever happens, I'm, I'm ranged in two different ways? What were you thinking? 
I was wanting him to be very adaptable. It's okay. really hard to plan when you don't know the group that you're going to be with. And so mm -hmm. sometimes you can know your group very well and know, well, this person's going to handle the healing. This person's going to handle the lock picking and everything like that. And sometimes you really don't know them. Um, if you're yeah. online or if you just don't know the group that well and a character who isn't dedicated to a very specific role may not be able to do that role because someone else does it better or someone else specialized a bit more um, and so I wanted this person to be able to kind of fill a lot of different roles and I saw that as part of his character he grew up in a tribe having to take on a lot of different roles. Would he need to hunt? Would he need to defend? Would he need to scout out, you know, danger and stuff like that? How would that interplay with the spells that he had available? And so I wanted him to be able to kind of hold out on his own if he needed to, because that felt more of like how he was as a person. Cool. I like that approach. Do you want to go over his spells? What do you want to go over next? Yeah, we can go over his spells. All right, here we go. So I will admit that I had a really tough time picking out the spells that I wanted. Um, the occult spell list is the one I'm least familiar with. It's a lot of spells that do either mental damage or, you know, negative damage, or, you know, it would be something you'd see on a psionic or something like that. And so making it work for the sorcerer and for the role that I wanted took a little bit of extra time and I really had to spend some time about like well does this fit the theme does this fit mechanically um, but what I landed on I was pretty happy with especially the one that I like the most is the cantrip telekinetic projectile mm -hmm. and the reason I like it so much is that with my ranged weapon oh, I think he that would be there. That's the virus for you. They're just dropping like flies. <laughs> so he probably put his headset, but I got unplugged at the PC or something like that. So I'd give him a second to uh, come back. Reset. Oh, there we go. Cool. All right. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, back. How much did I miss? <laughs> you missed seven seconds. Uh, telekinetic projectile. One that's, round. That's yeah. Yes. Where, where, so tele where? telekinetic projectile, if I use my sling and I miss the person I'm trying to attack, then the ammunition is either sitting at their feet or maybe a few feet away. Telekinetic projectile, as long as I'm within 30 feet, that's unattended object. And so I can use telekinetic projectile to have like it attack that person again and fling itself at them and deal damage to them. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the really cool things is the type of damage depends on the item that you're flinging. Um, a concept I did for, a, for another character, not the, the one I've done for this, um, was um, a dedication into, into Rogue. Um, and his telekinetic projectile was to do with his daggers and he just had a whole like band layer of daggers that he'd use for piercing damage awesome cool i remember in uh when they ran that uh uh pathfinder show that has all the it's mostly girls it's like one fellow and a bunch of girls and what's that show called i forgot it already it's of ever flame yeah that's it yeah the yeah. one of the girls was oh, using telekinetic projectiles the first time i ever heard of it and i was like i was looking in the crb while the show was going on and uh their very first fight was some like earth elemental thing in a field and they started using that, that spell. I was like, what the hell? I never heard it before. So that was really new to me to see. And the way you're talking about it now tactically is quite cool. <laughs> I wonder if like I... you're, you can, you know, have a couple of hammers in your hand, your pack, and you just throw them on the battlefield as your first oh, action yeah. and just don't do anything with them and then move, 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 yeah. drop two hammers and then move somewhere else and then use them as a projectile, hit someone in the back of the head, maybe get them flat-footed, who knows. You can definitely do that. Yeah. Um, that is a solid plan. They're like, why is that guy carrying an anvil with him? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it I looks think like... it's honestly a little sad, too, because since telekinetic projectile uses a spell attack action instead of like a ranged touch attack or something like that, it actually has a higher chance to hit than I did when I first threw the stone mm -hmm. because my charisma is higher. Well, it's very, uh, it's very a uh, return of the Jedi. If you think about it, you got stuff flying all over the place, hitting Luke. So it's that kind of vibe. I think it's really neat. If someone could be really creative with that one. Well, and it adds, uh, my spell crafting modifier. So it adds my charisma modifier to damage too. So it has a higher chance to hit than when I just would sling this down and it would do more damage. So show us on the laugh. sheet for people who don't know where, where would someone find it on their sheet? Would it be on the first page here or would it be down uh, there on spell the spell page? was on the same page as spells. Okay. 
So the spell attack roll is a plus 11, and your spell DC is 21. So this situation, if you hit someone with, let's just say, you know, you say you'd thrown a hammer at it. You didn't in this case, or whatever you did throw. Mm-hmm. Where is that bonus of damage come from that you just mentioned? Where do we find it on the sheet? So the bonus to damage is specific to the spell. So that spell specifically said that you add your spell casting modifier to the damage. Otherwise, you don't. So is that we're adding the seven from this proficiency, or are you adding the spell attack roll 11? What number would someone add to the damage? They wouldn't add uh, any of those numbers. It's just your charisma modifier. Okay, so the spell just for the attack statistic. is different from the damage of the spell. Gotcha, gotcha. So they would just pick, in this case, your charisma modifier is four, so they're getting a plus four of their damage with the spell. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Cool, yep, I learned something. Plus yeah. four. The, the whole idea about the show is for you to secretly teach me without realizing. <laughs> well, these are Huh? Say again? Can't well, auto we just teach you? Yeah, okay. So, uh, illusionary disguise, magic weapon, mage armor, unseen servant. You want to walk through those with us? Yeah, so some of those I got from my bloodline. Illusory disguise, um, touch of idiocy, and then uh, there was one at third level, I think blindness, that I all had to take. You know, the, took up one of my spots. But the rest of them, I was trying to figure out what would be good for him and try and keep the vibe. Magic weapon, the way they wrote it, is very, very, very nice at early levels. And mage oh, armor yeah. literally lasts all day, so... Now, how much bonus is it going to give you to armor? Do you remember off the top of your head? Because your armor class it's just is... just plus one. Since it's up all day, I put it in with my AC on the front page. Okay, good idea. Okay. Yeah. So you're I, 21. I would, I would say magic weapon um, is, is the, the one that is so nice. Because not only do you get a plus one to your attack, you also get an additional dice worth of damage. Yikes, that's nasty. Yeah. That's a, and that's you can cast it on your friends. So it doesn't have to be you. You can, you can cast it on the frontline fighter, and he's hitting. It's brilliant. That's really nasty. And magic weapon, I think it's on, what, like 348 or something like that, or 349. Where is it? Here it is, 349. Yeah, so it acts like a plus one striking weapon, plus one item bonus to attack rolls, increase the number of weapon damage dice by two. So that's pretty good. That's like a nice damage add. Yeah, so if you're, if you're using a um, you know, two-handed weapon, that's already got quite a big damaging dice getting an extra one so nice oh, oh yeah. and 2d12 always feels good oh yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> tell us more about your spells man so the rest of them i wanted to get some utility options so with unseen servant just the option to interact with objects and you know kind of be able to move things that i couldn't see um blur you know is just a basic one to use in combat if i needed it one of my favorite ones was though i think it's invisibility sphere it's a third level spell a little bit farther down mm-hmm. okay let's go down uh, here. amazing spell it's yeah that, amazing that was <laughs> also one of the best spells when you're trying to stealth your group and sneak it in was somewhere also rather counterproductively used on knights of everflame where they the, the the bard in question uh, that we were talking about earlier cast it, and then um, the person that was bringing the the, the boat over ended up being a um, blind drogue, so uh, they didn't actually need to be invisible. <laughs> <laughs> he could smell them and hear them. <laughs> That's a three point five spell, if I'm not mistaken. I, I think I remember that yeah. from a long time ago. So OGL D twenty spell cool definitely i i remember it fondly mm-hmm. it's when i started my role playing life was 3.5 cool yeah honestly i feel like this character could meet the adventures at level five and suddenly you've got five or six lizard folk you know just dropping on you because they were all invisible yeah 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 and then the i mean having the blindness the haste the magic weapon the mage armor blur mm-hmm. a lot of good cc in well, there Touch of Idacy is kind of crazy. It just applies like a funky condition, if I remember correctly, doesn't it? Yes. I think it adds stupefied. Yeah, let's see what, yeah, stupef- my... what stupefied do. Let me flip the back of my book while you guys tell us. Yeah. In, in my personal opinion, a cult is one of the best spell lists if you want to be somebody who's doing buffs and debuffs on, on your allies and enemies. Oh, absolutely. It is also the second largest spell list behind the arcane spell list. 
Oh, interesting. It's I page really 622. Compared. Yep, 622. Hadn't really compared how long the spell lists were in comparison to each other. So. Yeah, I believe the divine list is one of the shortest. Uh, but the trade-off, obviously, is that if you're a cleric, the most traditional divine user, you get access to every spell. You just have to prepare them each day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I like your lizard guy. I think he's cool. You want to tell us about anything else with him? No, I'm pretty happy with him. I think he's really interesting. I can see him in my mind already. I, I don't don't worry. I'm not imagining Deacon, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you know your old school Neverwinter lore or whatever, um, now in your mind, what does this guy look like? He doesn't look like the guy from that Star Trek episode, right? Oh, I wanted him to kind of blend in with the crowd, especially since he can change the color of his, you know, scales in his skin. I wanted him, since he's neutral, he's, you know, very quiet. I wanted him to, like, have muted colors if he wanted to, have bright colors if he wanted to, especially with his charisma. Like, if you're in a town and there's a carnival going on, he could spend an hour and suddenly be, like, these ridiculous colors and really blend in with that environment and very approachable. But then if he needs to, he can still you know, meld into the brush if he really needs to. So I'm really happy with him. An illusionary disguise means you can do even more nasty or tricky things if you really need to, right? Mm -hmm. Tell people who Especially don't know what, it, what you can do. aren't welcome. <laughs> so illusionary disguise is on 345. You create an illusion that causes you to appear as another creature of the same body shape and roughly similar height within six inches, blah, 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 and 50 pounds yourself. Good enough to hide your identity, but doesn't impersonate someone. So like you just talk about walking around through a town somewhere and everyone doesn't like your kind, um, you can make yourself look like somebody else when you make it through town. Actually, since I set that as a signature spell, illusory disguise, I think you can heighten up to third level and look like someone specific. Oh, wow, that's cool. So you can impersonate someone. That could come in handy when you're not like fighting for your life somewhere. As long as you've seen them before, you can look exactly like them. That sounds nasty. Yeah, big bonuses to deception checks. Oh, wow. That's cool. That's a fun spell, and that's why it gets a good description, too. Well, he's very cool. I like him a lot. Anything else? Do you guys have any questions or comments about this uh, this guy's build? His name, once again, is Gishkum Swiftclaw. My only comment would be that, you know, the two characters we've seen so far would be really classic examples of the way this rule set works, where you can have radically different approaches to building characters you know, one that's very, very fluffy and, and follows a theme, and the, the other one that's approached a little more mechanical, but they're both great characters. You know, the fluffy character isn't weak. You know, he's not going to fall behind statistically the way this system works. He's going to have a role to fill, and he's just not going to be some sort of silly sidekick character. Yeah, totally viable. So Which you're... can happen in other games where if you yeah. don't pay enough attention to... The mechanical benefit you could inadvertently you know choose something that's that's just not that was one of my least favorite all. things about first edition pathfinder the the fact that there are so many feats but some of them are so behind the curve that it can severely damage your uh survivability and whatever else down the line mm -hmm. yeah right. i mean unfortunately that was a just a pass over from 3.5 because it happened all the same in that as well. Would you guys think that that's okay. kind of a result of all the squish, of the, how the compression of the numbers? Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, go ahead, Fitcher, you're saying first. No, you're good. I was just going to say that um, Pathfinder 2nd Edition doesn't punish role-playing, so you can build a character that actually has a lot of options and is more fun to be and to play the role and not fall behind in the numbers. Yeah, yeah that's a great statement. I think, in fact, I can't think of any other game that even does that. No, I mean, not I, even um, the most popular one, 5e at the moment, is is as uh, fluid in terms of keeping the numbers as equal with the role play. You know, if I was Paizo, I would make a book. I would make a book. This is a suggestion, Paizo, if you're ever listening to our show here. I would make a book, and like you did with some of your villain books you did in Pathfinder 1, I would make a hero book. And I would just create every page as a piece of concept art. And here's a really neat, interesting theme. You could even poll the community or Pathfinder Society. 
and it could be called the Book of Heroes, and you can make one like you have Beast Jerry 1, Beast Jerry 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You can do the same thing, the Book of Heroes, and the young people and people who are new can reverse engineer some of your heroes like the Rogues Gallery was in the old days in AD&D. You know, Dritz de Erden yeah. is basically in the Rogues Gallery if you look at it closely, and uh, that would be a really great way for someone to get inspired by something. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Cause they have the ensemble cast with Mauricio and Kira and all these other characters, yeah. but they don't have this like super crazy hero thing. And their old villain books have a lot of really crazy, neat characters in it. They need to make some hero books. We'll take a 5% royalty for that idea, <laughs> which we'll do to hero. upgrade our audio equipment. <laughs> hero books. Are you talking about the villain codex from Pathfinder first edition? Yeah. Yeah. I love that book. I referenced it in one of my older junky, sillier videos, trying to inspire people to just create a game and lift a character from another game system. I got the book in here somewhere. They have it in the little tiny version, the NPC codex. Uh, let's see. Where it is it here? The villain codex. There we go. The villain codex from the first edition of Pathfinder, sorry about the loud noise, uh, is just full of page of page of everything from infernal zealots to fang monastery prowlers and all this kind of weird, crazy uh, enemies. And the uh, NPC codex is the ones that have so much personality. I got a, I got the little baby book version of that one here. I know you can't see it on the screen or anything. You guys probably own it already, but the old NPC codex is just page after page after page of these really engaging characters. They should do the same kind of thing, but make them player characters, you know? Yeah, definitely. But the, uh, one of the wonderful things about um, Pazer is the fact that, um, you know, they do listen to the community. Uh, and even though they've, they've said, obviously, they want to, to bring new stuff into Pathfinder 2nd Edition, they are also still, obviously, redoing the stuff from 1st Edition mm -hmm. and bringing it into the new rule set. Um, I mean, some of the, the new classes that are going to be in the Advanced Players Guide um, are, are ones that have obviously been in first edition for quite a while now. Yeah, I'm going to throw up the uh, the video screen here. This is the this is the little baby small version of the book, little, you know, trade paperback. Just to give people an example is this whole book is every single page is, you know, Furious Crusader and Axe Lord. This little cool piece of constant art. It's like character, character, character. Look at this Death Whisperer. I mean, that's super creative. Just give Wayne Reynolds, tell him, draw a character a day for me, please, and we'll make something to fit. And that's all they need to do. And I think it would be really wonderful for them to have, you know, buy the PDF version and print it up and take it to your next game. And maybe even the secondary page could be the level 1, level 5, level 10, level 15 version of that character. Yeah. And they can, that's a whole merchandising opportunity if you want to quote space balls. <laughs> also, <laughs> also, it's it's great for, for GMs who... To throw in, you know, and an because even though it's it's here is designed for players with this concept, you can still use it for NPCs. Yeah, absolutely, it could be. There is a there is a chapter in the new game mastery guide that has these. Yes, NPCs. I need to buy that. I haven't bought it yet. I was wanting to get the hard copy first, but I'm I'm just going to go ahead and break down and get the PDF version. <laughs> Great. I don't want to get the off topic guide too much. Is really good. Yeah, that that way you can print them off as well. Cool. Let me pull our character sheets back up here. Uh, All right. I you want to move to I another have... sorcerer? or uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we can we can follow up a lizard folk with a slightly different lizard folk. If... Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I, have, I have a dwarf idea. I didn't mean to I overlap. I'd already made the character. <laughs> Nobody can blame me. <laughs> it's all right. We're different. It's so... all good. <laughs> so let's see. Who do we have next, then? Uh, I can go. I don't have a sheet, but uh, it's a pretty easy to follow. Uh, I should actually probably get a sheet together for you in the next couple of minutes, shouldn't I? If you want to, yeah. yeah if you if you put best. it in, if you put it in, uh, if you build it on your phone and just export it to PDF and email it to yourself and drag it into. Oh, um, are you using Path Builder or? Oh, uh, I think some of us have. Some people did this stuff manually. Yeah, yeah I have. Why don't we keep it on the visual side for people watching the video? And if you have something cranked out in the background. Um, I'm working on it. I'll there you go. <laughs> Just do it between traffic lights. Awesome. So what no, do you have no, next? No. no, I'm in my house now. I made it. Oh, okay, cool. It's safe. Allegedly. Um, <laughs> 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 what do you have? Zaldor or Zaldor? He's the other lizard folk. You want to go next? Is, uh, yeah, I can go. I can go next. Go for it. Um, so as you can see, slightly different lizard folk. He's a cliff scale. 
um, which basically means he has little suckers on his feet and he can climb things with them. Cool. Um, so I also took um, Catfall because I sort of envisioned him use, using the, the, the climb, climbing speed and everything that he has to his advantage. But, you know, it makes sense that he'd be able to fall a bit more gracefully and, and, and not hurt himself um, if he's climbing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously with the, the, the fluff that's in, in the text for the cliff scale uh, lizard folk, you know, they live in, in sort of mountain ranges and stuff. Um, so... Uh, he's also from a Lost Omens. Is that a Lost Omens one? Lost Omens character guide, yeah. Okay. Um, all of the lizard folk stuff's in there at the moment. I should have listened to that earlier. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention um, well enough. Yeah, lizard folk, Leshy, Hobgoblin are the new ones that are, that are in there. Um, I picked it up uh, as a physical book myself. Good. Um, but yeah, with Saldor... Um, I sort of um, was thinking, um, like my my beginning point was, well, if a lizard folk had um, some sort of magic, um, again, I hadn't really formed what sort of magic I was going to choose at that point. Um, but I was thinking, if, if if a lizard folk had some sort of magic, what sort of role in the lizard folk society would they possibly be given? Um, and this is where I chose the background of the emissary, and I sort of built the whole concept of, of how um, his sorcery would work, and, and his, almost sort of like his personality around uh, him being the emissary for his particular tribe. Um, cool. So, yeah, so um, he spell-wise is, is heavily on sort of like crowd control, um, and being able to get out of trouble as quickly as possible, which is why uh, he's got stuff like um, where's it come? Entangle. Um, but then he's also got stuff uh, that will just straight out um, murder some things. Um, Sudden Bolt um, is actually a uncommon spell, just to point that out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what does uncommon spell be for people who don't know? So this is the, these are things um, that you would have to talk to your, your GM about acquiring. Okay. Um, that's, that's what the un uncommon tag means. It doesn't necessarily mean um, that you can't have it, mm -hmm. but you sort of have to have to get permission. Uh, and sometimes you might need a particular um, story thing to, as a reason or um, just so that it's, within what your GM has sort of planned for for play, really. Um, so if, if, for example, a, if a player wanted to do something like that, now where would they find that? If they want to read up on it and say, ask their GM, is that going to be in a Lost Omens player guide as well? It's not in CRB, is it? Um, not that one, though. I think that is... Or is it a homebrew from a player? or? Um, no, so the, I was using the... the builder app so it gotcha. will be in it's in one of their book. books okay yeah but i don't know which one because i chose it from from the app itself no problem the um, uncommon ones uh, a lot of them are coming from adventure paths and things of that nature oh, okay they're Good kind to of know. buried in there and so that uncommon tag they use a lot of this is something you gained from an adventure you went on so i'm not sure which book it is in but it's but it's legit it's legit those. okay it's from python yeah. then uh i've got it it's in pathfinder 151 the show must go on so you're right oh, that's the brand new extinction curse thing or whatever they've put together cool yeah it's number one of extinction curse cool okay so you um, summon no, a so... large bolt that you can put in your wheel well and yeah hold... <laughs> um the, the great thing about Sudden Bolt, and the reason why it's an uncommon spell, I think, is because it does the same amount of damage as Lightning Bolt. Oh, wow. The only difference is that Sudden Bolt's on a single creature, whereas Lightning Bolt is in a line, so anything in that line will get hit by the... I think it was... It's a 60-foot line for Lightning. Yeah. It's a basic reflex save. And it's four... And it's, I think it's 3d6, or 3d12, sorry, at the... Uh... 4012. Yeah, 40 lightning 12. bolt 348. Yeah, 40 so sudden bolt is the same 4012, but on the single person. Um so the my my thoughts between obviously um folk 
we see quite a lot on on electric mm-hmm. was because obviously his his clan was up in the mountains mm-hmm. um and he's an elemental sorcerer oh, um, okay so he uses the primal spell list um and my my whole thought with that was that obviously um they're up in the mountains um and generally storms and clouds and stuff tend to stick around uh <laughs> More yeah, respect for electricity. Size. Yeah. Oh, Does yeah, he have a small that. brass key and a kite in his backpack? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Huh. Um, but, yeah, so it was this whole sort of, like, weather sort of worshipping lizard folk that I sort of had in my mind for his tribe. Um, and being one of the, the sort of, like, chosen by nature... Um, and given this power, he was the the emissary between uh, his tribes and other settlements and other lizard folk tribes. Um, and I sort of had this whole thing where the emissaries would sort of be sent out on their own because they have this this sort of like almost divine power. Very shamanistic in uh, world history. By, uh, yeah, um, and so just sort of going along that whole sort of feeling that they'd just be on their own which is why i focused on um the sort of like spells to be able to to protect himself um and control his his enemies somewhat in terms of being able to stop them in the tracks so that he mm-hmm. can get away um and also being able to deal with the various sort of creatures he may come across which is why he's got a bit of fire in there as well because some things obviously probably run away if you could just conjure fire out of your fingertips um <laughs> especially <laughs> if you're a lizard um but uh along the like other lines i um heavily went into diplomacy um and and quite a, and society for him um because of his sort of like obviously his diplomatic ties with being an emissary um and it was very it was very focused around his background um for him so he's got multilingual as his, as his background feet which means that he can obviously um talk to to all the different places that he's venturing off to mm-hmm. to emissary between his tribe and and theirs um obviously he's got combat climber uh, as one of his um things for being a um, cliff scale lizard folk mm-hmm. so he can climb up the wall without needing his hands because of his little sucky pads on his feet <laughs> um, which means that he can just like one of his uh, tactics that I'd use in a combat is him to just walk up a wall and then cast spells from somewhere that nobody can really get him at mm-hmm. unless they're firing spells back at him or, or maybe an arrow or two if you can't talk your way out um, of it, climb the nearest mountain and start blasting lightning he, bolts from on high. Exactly. <laughs> and make sure everyone's entangled so they can't get to you. Yep. Yeah. And then and then they're sitting ducks for the lightning. There you go. I, I have to say I love that the cliff scale lizard folk, it's not that they're really good at climbing, it's that they're just like geckos and they have yeah. sucky sucky pads on the end of their feet so they can just yeah. kinda hang out like Spider Man. That's pretty awesome. much Gecko's um, grip. The, <laughs> the only disadvantage is you can't wear shoes, otherwise it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> no shoes in the service. Yeah. Though that that does mean if you fall into a pit trap and there's spikes, oof. Ouch. Yeah. I mean <laughs> no shoes protection. is probably the least of your worries at that So point. your your yeah. lizard can be defeated with Lego bricks then, is that it? <laughs> Lego bricks. <laughs> uh, Two by four possibly. red piece. <laughs> Uh, luckily, unless they're made out of wood, I don't think somebody's made a uh, Lego in Pathfinder just yet. Um, <laughs> think Cal- how many yeah, Cal- digitation spells it would take. Yeah, it would, uh, especially with the coloring as well. Um, and then with stuff like, um, hit, well, with his cantrips, um, I went for sort of, again, sort of situational damaging spells. Um, and then two sort of utilities that would be mm-hmm. useful um, in his uh, diplomacy. So Redora, so if there was some sort of um, object he'd come into contact with, he could detect if it was magical uh, and determine what school of magic it was. 
and potentially use that as as a favor to help out and then with dancing lights um that's just to to make things look pretty say he was in a in a, in a tent for example and the lighting wasn't that great he cool. could just make it look nice as, as a gesture of goodwill if, it, if you can't scare them or vaporize them or climb on their ceiling you can always like mesmerize them right <laughs> yeah you just dazzle them a bit um and can you attach to the ceiling uh yeah you, you can too um probably take uh, like an athletics check or a strength check or something i imagine oh but yeah that's that, kind of homebrewed at that point yeah that would be up to to the gm um but there, there isn't uh doesn't doesn't say you can't stick to the ceiling um it does say for for some things you need to do an athletics check um but i think that purely depends on the sort of surface you're picking up um but generally speaking, yeah, I think it's a 15 foot climbing speed. So, yep. Cool. Any uh, feedback or questions for this guy? I think he's actually personally, just from my opinion, I like the whole shamanistic vibe of the mountain thing tied together. I was seeing all kinds of Maya Aztec clothing. Maybe you blend it in with some, I like world history. I'm such a nut for that stuff. <laughs> uh, with something you could have um, maybe an upper Mongolia vibe too, but there's some character races in Elder Scrolls Online that have that Argonians that have that kind of look. So I think it's really cool. I like the color element too, and all the diplomacy and all that. So I don't know. I think he's really neat, really neat character. What are, what are thoughts you guys have? I just like that you took resist energy. Honestly, it's such a good <laughs> spell. Not enough people take it. Now why is well, that? Well, you get you get it as um, one of the spells given to you by being an elemental sorcerer. So I didn't even actually pick that one. <laughs> yeah, it's just oh, given to oh, me. Oh, I know. I, I may have had that idea myself. So. Yeah, and it's just another to pick example a of three sorcerers. You know that in other games might feel very much the same, but a few choices, and they're all completely different. Yeah, yeah even we, if they're the same race. Yeah, we just had just... three different spell lists. Yeah. Cool. All right, let me get this other screen back up again. I got your character sheet downloaded in the background, Chromosis. Who wants to, who yep. wants to go next? We have a couple more here to go. This is all really cool, different story. A lot of lizards tonight, but nothing wrong with I, that, I right? I don't mind going next, <laughs> honestly. If, if how, how are you guys doing on time? Does anyone need to cut away soon to get your chance to sell us your sorcerer? I'm good. good to stick around. All right. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good to keep going. Let, how, Tassarik, you want to go next? Sure, absolutely. All right, I'm going to pull you up here. What do you got? You got the Hobgoblins, so you're a, d a departure, right? Yeah, we are really selling this Lost Omens character guide. <laughs> <laughs> well, that 5% royalty, you know. <laughs> yeah, the Hobgoblin is coming from there as well. Okay. So one of the things, when I knew we were doing Sorcerers, I wanted to, to sort of get a look at the Fae bloodline because – one of the things that I love about Paizo and about Pathfinder First Edition are all of the options from the Fae. And the, especially as a GM, uh, on the 5e, not to knock 5e at all, but the, there are just not as many published right now. Uh, and so seeing some of my favorite options of the Fae and being able to use them, Knowing that I was going to go with that bloodline, I sort of picked my favorite monster to start. Oh, okay. Uh, and re tried to connect how this monster ended up affecting this hobgoblin. And I wanted to showcase hobgoblin because I don't feel like they get played enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and weirdly, hobgoblins are very superstitious about what they consider elf magic. Uh, and so in his community and in this... Um, even to himself, he would view this as very much a curse, even oh. though it may not have been. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the the monster that I drew upon was uh, my favorite of the fake creatures that Paizo has published from first edition. I didn't think he made the bestiary in the second edition yet. Uh, and so I went looking for like an image in first edition just to sort of uh, snap my fingers and say, oh, shucks, I can't use that one. Uh, but he, apparently he has ended up in one of the recent adventure paths because there is a second edition stat block for the bogeyman himself. <laughs> That's awesome. That's cool. And I love that creature 
love his stat block in first edition. The second one is even better. He is a horrific, murderous serial killer that sows discord wherever he goes uh, and tries to sow disruption in small communities and pin it on somebody else. Uh, and so wanting that as an inspiration of the Fade bloodline really sort of piloted where I wanted this character to go. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Very interesting. So, yeah, go yeah. tell us more. With the, the Hobgoblin heritages, uh, I went with one of the ones that I thought mechanically was pretty cool and thought, eh, how does that kind of work? Uh, the Elfbane Hobgoblin is going to give you a reaction. So a reaction where you can resist elf magic simply whenever you're the target of a saving throw that derives from magical effects. Okay. You get a plus one if you use your reaction oh, before okay. you roll. Uh, if it's an arcane-based spell effect, it's a plus two. Oh, that's pretty decent. Wow. Yeah. So that one I really wanted because I knew kind of in my head that I wasn't going to pick up Counterspell because I had a plan. Uh, so getting through that, and I wanted to, to go with a uh, sort of a thematic background as well. So I picked up Charlatan. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlatan's going to give me the ability to boost that charisma a little bit further because your ability scores are sl somewhat tied to your ancestry, somewhat tied to your background. There are all different things that filter into it. And I needed background, kind of wanted to go into the whole sorcerer build, heavy on charisma, but also have this element of deception because this character would be one that is not welcome in his own society once he's revealed himself. They're a very militaristic society. They are highly suspicious of magic. Uh, and so we needed him to be safe until he could find a way out. So, so did that, is that be... background uh, in the CRB? Is there one of the later ones? The charlatan? No, charlatan is from the CRB. Let's see if we can find it in the background while you tell us all about it. Yeah, so the charlatan is going to come from a background of someone who had to pull the wool over somebody's eyes and very much... Somebody's eyes probably already caught it on that first page of the character sheet. There's a long sword listed. I saw that. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Yeah, I saw uh, that right but down here. The, Oops, here we go. the charlatan thing is very much building into he was raised in this sort of militaristic society. He was going to be brought up to be a soldier. He's just not very good at it. And every once in a while, he'll freak out. And some sort of magical effect will happen. And he needs to try to seek understanding of what is this. And with the, the Fae bloodline and going with that for an inspiration, that was my sort of potential GM. Here is your gift from me. Uh, that Here's your potential for this giant uh, big bad and use them as you, how you see fit. I love, and the, so I love the Charlotte background. Go ahead. Yeah, so the charlatan background gives you a skill feat, which we haven't talked a ton about skill feats yet, but I kind of built all of them based around deception. Each mm -hmm. one gives you kind of not really a boost to deception, but more of a little trick or a gimmick uh, that you can use when you're using something that features that skill. Okay. So the, uh, the one that came from charlatan was Charming Liar, mm -hmm. uh, where you'll have this ability to... Uh, if you are lying to someone and using deception to try to lie to them, it's an actual action delineated in the book. And you can sort of go into that if that's what you really want to do as far as mechanical role play. Uh, but Charming Liar will allow you to give a deception role to lie to them, but use it as a diplomacy to affect their impression of you. Oh, okay. All right. So it sort of pulls double duty, and mm -hmm. instead, since I didn't take diplomacy and lean on deception, that was a pretty good pickup to have just coming from the background. Now, lie to me is going to be, um, oh, I forget how that one works, but I think it's something about um, when people are actually, oh, when you're trying to lie to someone and you fail, that the subsequent attempts to try to lie to them generally are much more difficult as far as the DC goes. But this gives you a slight bonus to subsequent attempts to lie to them if you've been caught in a lie. That is then... not quite correct. Nope. Thank no, you. Uh... I appreciate that. 
lie to me is where you can use deception instead of um, perception to s tell if somebody else is lying to your character. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I couldn't recall that one uh, yeah. totally, but it does make sense as far as where I was going with that. And yeah. so rumor is going to give you a bonus to spread a rumor in a town about someone as sort of a downtime activity almost. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's one of those things where if I need to throw the heat onto somebody else from a role-playing standpoint, I'm able to do that quite a bit better now. Oh, that's really cool. I like it. That's it's awesome. a situation that I kind of wanted him to find himself in. Yeah, it gives you a mechanical edge for, for something that you, you would naturally um, try to probably role-play to do as this character. Yeah, this is, the, this is the one that's definitely going to be pushing for deception to roll initiative. Uh, and I'm, I wanted to try to find as many creative ways or force myself into it as many times as possible uh, because he's got that really high deception score and all of these really neat little gimmicks around it. So the let's talk about the longsword. Sure. We'll that was my ancestry page. feat. So the, uh, the ancestry feat is um, hobgoblin weapon familiarity. There's not a lot in the hobgoblin kit, again, being that culture that's super... Um, superstitious about magic that appealed to me as mechanically this is kind of what I want to do so I found one that I thought well you know that's interesting for a sorcerer to have access to these weapons and the list of them are um... oh where did I put that okay so the list of those are composite longbows shortbows uh, regular longbow shortbows glaives halberds long swords, not short swords, interestingly enough, and spears. So they're very heavy sort of military weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I get the the trained feature with those. So I have the long sword, but you'll notice my strength score is a zero. It's kind of a prop. <laughs> nah. So he's he's got the long sword, but since the game sort of leans into that, keeping the curve pretty tight, around the numbers, if I'm trained in it, even if I have a plus zero, I have a solid shot to hit. It's not, I wouldn't consider it good, but it's it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but he does have those throwing knives for if you're actually trying to, to take someone out with that third action, when most spells that you're gonna cast are gonna take two of your three actions in a round. That's cool, so very cool. We've got the, the throwing knives there, which qualifies simple weapons and you can melee with them if you need to mm -hmm. and you've got the short bow which you picked up from that weapon familiarity as well cool uh, all of that loadout comes from uh picking up fourth i think my fourth level class feat is bespell weapon so bespell weapon is going to let you once a turn if you cast a spell to to sort of siphon some of the residual energy into your weapon and so if you make an attack before your next turn uh, you're going to to deal a little bit extra damage. So I don't have like a strength score that I'm going to add to that damage, but I do have an extra, it's usually a D6 if I'm remembering correctly, of a different type of damage based on the school of the spell you cast. So the spell weapon was a, a big sort of pickup there, and that's why I didn't go further in the build yet into this path builder was calling it Collegiate Attendant Dedication. Mm -hmm. This is one of the archetype dedications from Lost Omens Character Guide. That is the, uh, that's the Magambian attendant. So the Magambia is a big sort of uh, magical school. And I kind of wanted him to get out of his home culture and try to learn his impulse would have been to control this mm -hmm. uh, and to try to hide it. So I wanted to go into the, the Magambia to try to understand it. And so... Uh, the Mwangi expanse, big jungle scenery uh, within the setting of uh, Paizo's Galarian. Mm -hmm. uh, and the one of the premier, the premier magical academy exists there. And so the collegiate attendant or the Magambian attendant, you essentially volunteer as a, uh, to learn more about magic, you become a research assistant to one of the professors at the academy. And so he's traveling around, learning some more things, trying to figure out uh, how to put them to use. Wow, that's very cool. That's super creative. 
Yeah, Keep one going. of the uh, one of the things that show up later in that dedication. So the dedication, much like the uh, class dedications, the, these archetype dedications sort of stand in for where the prestige classes were in the last uh, edition. You have to meet certain requirements or for some of them. Uh, and for this one, you had to become a, a certain ranking member of the Magambia. Uh, and you had to have, I think it's either primal or arcane spell casting. And one of the things that that university is doing is they're trying to fuse these traditions of magic together. Uh, and this was an interesting way I found to pick up the one thing that I was missing in this character design mm -hmm. from the sorcerer, uh, sort of the sorcerer line. There was one thing that pushed me over the edge. I have to go this route. So at six level, we won't do, go into it, but the, at six level, there's a thing where I can pick up anything from a druid or a wizard, any meta magic feat, once a day, and use it once a day. Oh, that gives you flexibility. And, yeah, yeah, a lot and of the, flexibility. The one I really wanted in this build was conceal spell, and it's only on the wizard list. Oh, okay. Now, why would you pick so that? So rather one? than going, what tell uh, us the power of that spell? to you? Yeah, yeah. For someone yeah, who doesn't so a know, conceal it. spell is going to to allow you to add an additional action to your spell casting action. Most spells two actions. Some of them take three. Some of them can be one to three. Most spells are two actions. If you add that third into a two action spell or a second into a one action spell, you can use conceal spell or reach spell or different meta magic feats. So these meta magic feats add an action to alter the spell a little bit. Reach spell will extend the uh, the Touch distance to thirty. Of yeah. Yeah. Yep. And widen spell will extend the radius. And then you've got uh, conceal spell, which shows up in the wizard. If you are really trying to pull off the pointing at the other guy and trying to make the check of, oh no, it was that guy that cast the spell. I'm over here with this sword and a shield. By mm -hmm. the way, shield does not require proficiency to use. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the interesting things about sorcerers specifically is that they can, uh, there's a, a bit in their spell casting description that says they can replace most material components with somatic components. Mm -hmm. Somatic components in the system, and correct me if I'm wrong, do not require a free hand to use. I don't think so. Does it require a manipulate no. or anything like that? No, it doesn't, does it? As as long as your hand can move about to make the gestures. Um, yeah, like, like carrying an anvil. <laughs> yeah, even right. while holding something, you can you can do it. It's it's only if your hands are like bound or, if, for example, you were holding like a very heavy box. Um, that you I think we're actually be able... waiting for a clarification on that because of the wording. It says like you have to be able to make the movements either with something you're holding and so it can't be too heavy or something like that. And so we're trying to figure out like, well, can I make it with a two handed weapon? What about a one handed weapon? What about a light one handed weapon? Yeah, yeah. there is there yeah. is probably some further clarification. Needed. I think in the errata that they released um, was when they specified that you could do it with a held weapon. It seems to make sense. Like, I mean, like, like, like you said, you've got the, the two-handed weapons. Like, does, does that happen with that? I'd argue that you can just take one hand off to cast a spell yeah. and then put it back on. You just Babe Ruth but, it. Yeah. Just yeah. point in the stands and hold that your two-handed weapon in the offhand. Yeah. 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 Well, dropping First. a grip is, an action, is free, but yeah. uh, like going it. to a two-handed grip is, a, is an action. Right. So it's a, it's a decision whether or not he can have both sword and shield out, but he can probably do it with the bow. Uh, and so he'll have some opportunity to be able to pull that off. Cool. Yeah, so, uh, something I've seen actually is a lot of times, um, I know in first edition, clerics or paladins could kind of get away with having a holy symbol on their weapon. Uh, yeah. For, uh, which a lot of GMs will kind of allow because it's, uh, I think it's within the rules, right? You spend a little extra gold and get like some Iomedan, Iomedan iconography on your sword or. You know, you're, you basically turn your Saren Ray holy symbol into a hilt, something like that. Mm -hmm. Nah. It's, um, it's kind of funky, edition, actually. Definitely. And your fleet, so you're moving 30, right? Yeah, so the general feats on that one, I considered training 
to, to sort of further buy into that, but I fully expect to get his dexterity up the next time ability boosts go around. Mm -hmm. So at that point, the studded leather or the chain shirt's not going to help me uh, any more than the extra dex. So I figured pick up fleet since he has a little bit of stealth training, the ability to get around as well. Cool. I like this guy. He's a good villain. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's I cool. Really like he's a cool character. Very cool. I like the fact that he's a, uh... It's, it requires someone to use their creativity to play a character like this with all the verbal diplomacy, charming liar, lie to me, all these kind of things, and being this hobgoblin that can't stand elves. And I mean, if you were to describe that character without talking about the spells, which we haven't gotten to next, you would think it's just a militaristic guy, right? He's going to yeah. look just like a, a, a mean you know, hobgoblin from Steading of the Hill Giant Chief in a basement somewhere, right? But this guy isn't. He's all these other things he could do. Do you want to uh, transition from there and just talk about some of your spell choices then? Absolutely. That let's last ancestry feat that got picked up was expert drill sergeant even, which is going to help him give a boost when allies are following an expert during mm -hmm. exploration mode. So there are even a few more things that give him this aura of this is not what we're expecting out of a spellcaster, and this is not what we're looking for the first moment that something magical happens. In fact, all the mating classes might collapse on you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. That's kind of where the spells come into play. <laughs> yeah, that's when you want to have command. <laughs> but you yeah. can't do that because you are um, a cult. I don't, know if, I don't know if command's in there, but you've got fear and gust of wind and ventriloquism and all kinds of neat stuff. You want to, and hideous laughter. You want to run <laughs> oh, us through yes. your spells? Because these are cool. Yeah, so uh, the Fey Bloodline is going to give you the primal uh, tradition. Excuse me, I'm and... primal, not it's set a cult by mistake, sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, it There is some overlap there, uh, and with the the evil Fey influence, that it's kind of, it leans a little more towards that overlapping area. So the, uh, the primal spells have a lot of cool things on the list. You get things like Fireball, you get things like Heal, uh, neither of those appear on this character's list because they simply did not fit anything I think this character would be doing. I didn't even take medicine. It was really tempting, but I didn't take medicine. Mm -hmm. So with cantrips, I have a few damaging ones. That Ray of Frost we were talking about the other night, it's yeah. very long range. Uh, Sigil, I wanted the ability, him to have this ability to sort of lean into that heritage and sow discord and maybe put a sigil somewhere that no one's able to identify what it is and come back later and have rumors spread about it. Yeah, I mean, no the first, first thing that spoke out to me when I saw sigil was that he'd probably be putting it on somebody else's like piece of armor or something to be like, it wasn't me, it was him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually got a couple of those. Uh, so as far as the, uh, I did pick up a couple of uncommon ones too. You'll see sudden bolt as a signature. If something absolutely cannot leave the room and needs to be put down, uh, no rumors spread that I don't want get spread. So somebody that... knows too much. Sudden bolt had to come in as like a, a damaging one for me. Uh, but again, GM discretion there. Uh, the rhyme one... slick is also an uncommon one. The one thing about Sigil, a lot of people underestimate it's only one inch, which is really small. Even if you try to take a pen and just write your name, you're already going outside of one inch square size. It's just a tiny little mark, and it would, no, no one would ever notice it. But go, that's one thing that, uh, well, for me, when I read the, I'm such a wordsmith guy, when I read some of the spells, like, ooh, it's only one inch square in size. We're not painting a big Warhammer logo on the wall here in blood. We're just doing a little etching on someone's armor or whatever. Or wherever. Yeah, no, this is no giant tag in the alleyway. Yeah, no, it's this not. This is a... What is that over there? Are we sure we know what this guy's doing? Yeah, just put it on the bill and just hand it back to the bartender. <laughs> but, but go through your but spell it smart. Also, hmm? It will okay. also make them ping if somebody does detect magic. Ah, good point. You can also use that to, to, to fool someone into thinking that something, a bag, has got something magical in it. It just looks like it has nothing but a receipt. <laughs> yep. As far as uh, making someone else look magical, the bloodline power here, or the blood magic power... Uh, that each of the bloodlines has for uh, for the Fae bloodline. It goes off when you cast either any of the granted spells or one of the bloodline spells. So the bloodline spells are focus spells. Uh, Fairy Dust is going to lower somebody's uh, will saves. 
Uh, and by somebody, I mean it's an area of effect. You sprinkle some dust around, uh, and it's a little bit harder to make that will save. Mm -hmm. But if you do that or cast, which ones did I get from the bloodline? Uh, Go Sound, Charm, Hideous Laughter, or Enthrall, those spells will also trigger effect that you can make like a visual illusory thing appear either on you with bright colored lights and sort of shifting. Uh, and it kind of gives you the benefit of concealment mm -hmm. or you can put it on somebody else. Oh, wow. That's crazy. That's really cool. I can see a lot of creative uses for all that. Yeah. So gust of wind is the gust of wind is there for the, Oh, too many people coming too close to me or this one has to be away from me. Gust of Wind, I always felt like it was a very underestimated spell mm -hmm. uh, where you can just, if the save fails hard enough, you can block somebody from coming your way and if they critically fail it, they are prone and knocked back. Yeah, and they have to take an action to get back up too. If they're prone, if I remember correctly. Yes. Yep, and if it's still going, they then have to make the save all over again. Oh yeah. So most of these spells are just based around controlling what is going on. You've got darkness there so nobody can see. Uh, the hobgoblins do come with dark vision, so he can see inside of it, but he cannot see into it if he is outside of it. You'll see a flaw uh, in my design later that tried to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to sell it too short, but I was I, that's a, I made a human, but that's really great. I love the darkness is under, underutilized. It's such a big area. so Yeah. So the signature spells, I picked up fear because with signature spells, there are two schools of thought. You want something that's going to heighten because you can heighten it, and that's what signature spells are doing. Fear only has that third level heighten, but the ability to, if you need it, uh, to affect five people instead of one, that can be a, a pretty powerful thing. Oh, yeah. That area effect would just could save the day. Yeah. Uh, so then we've got that one so on signature, sudden bolt if you need damage. And then when you got to the third level spells, enthrall was the one given by the bloodline. Haste, I just couldn't pass up. Honestly, I wanted to go with slow, but not having, that's a mechanical thing on my end that I just couldn't give up as a personal weakness, uh, that slow is going to, uh, allow for a save haste is not so haste on our side is going to always be helpful slow even though it does have some effects if it's if the if the saving throw is successful uh but not a critical success then it has no effect yeah but so you cast I still it, couldn't justify it you cast it on yourself you get that extra action for a full minute which is what 10 rounds yeah yeah so if that's for strike and stride so you get to move you'll be able to zip all over the place with the fleet foot or what do you want to call it? And you can give it to someone else, and they, you know, if someone's casting, you can get two spells back to back because you have four actions, won't they, for a full ten rounds? Would that how that would work? Yep. So the fourth action has to be used either to strike or to stride. So it's okay. So casters, it can't be spell. You're right. Often, mm -hmm. Correct. We're often casting it on uh, some other melee one, but he has uh, a high enough dex that the bow shot is still going to be a pretty solid option. Mm -hmm. Granted, you've got the multiple attack penalty factoring in after a little bit. Yeah, with it being a bow, it'd only be minus four, right? Or is it going to be the minus five because it's a not considered a strength weapon? Is it con is the bow considered an agile weapon? I can't remember. Uh, the bow is not agile. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's going to be minus five, and minus then five. the third attack and anything after it is going to be minus uh, ten. So that's going to be it's going to negate the bonus I have to it. It'd be a straight roll, but that's it's still. It's not horrible. Well, the position is thing thing strong. At, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, the, the other thing to look at is most of the spells that instead ah. of uh, rolling an attack on the player's end that are affecting uh, like a spell DC and offering a saving throw, mm -hmm. casting those spells almost always does not count as an attack. I can't say for sure. I don't know every spell yet. Uh, but it would not affect that multiple attack penalty. Yeah, that's cool. So Very I could smart. do something like cast the darkness, uh, since darkness is a three action spell, and then still attack if I'm under the effects of haste. That ha that attack doesn't take a penalty. Yeah, because it's your first attack of your turn. 
And Wall of Thorns is simply a, we need to keep these people here. Mm -hmm. Keeping That's people here in uh, darkness while you pot shot them to death. Yeah. Uh, the innate spell from Message, I was able to pull an arcane cantrip based on that uh, Magambian dedication that I took at second level. So it's the one, it's a cantrip that I thought, oh, that'd be fun because I can whisper something and have it appear or have it get to somebody across the room that I'm working with without really shouting it. Cool. Any feedback on this guy's build? What do you think? I think it's really cool and very creative. I like the whole tone and the, the personality of this hobgoblin guy. Yeah. Um, I would have to have to say um, from everybody's, I, I like the the characters themselves. They've all got a, 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 something unique about them. That, that, that story hobgoblin elements. would definitely be uh, good to, that would be good to adventure with, that's for sure. Never a dull moment. Yeah, but, but you'd uh, you'd probably uh, be slow to trust him. <laughs> well, he could do uh, all the lying for has you. Story elements. Yeah, I, I like it. I think it's really cool. It's not something you know. We see these pictures of this scantily clad sorcerer character with the red and the tattoos and the blonde spiky hair. A lot of people just brush that off as like, I don't want to play uh, unarmored wizard. That's just a charisma caster. You know, the old legacy sorcerer from 3.5. All the things your people are doing here at Pathfinder 2nd Edition, that's why I think they, they need to make that hero book or something to show people what you could do. Because it requires some imagination. It requires someone to go into these books and dig through there and say, well, what if I mix this with this and this and make this concoction and I've got this really interesting character out of it? A person who's not real good at navigating game systems may not be able to see that right away. I think when it dawns on them that they can do these kinds of things, they'll uh, go, oh, wow, I didn't know I could make that. So that's one that, like, again, we're just reinforcing the same point over and over and over that the creativity for you is really almost boundless of what you can do. And you're never going to be overpowered. You're not going to build something that's bad, except until you see mine and you'll say, well, this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> now we have, uh, do you mind if we move on to another one? No, that's great. I, I love this guy. I think he's fantastic. All these are very cool. I really like them. Um, Let's see here. Uh, Chromosis, you have one. Have I missed anyone? Chromosis, you sent me one. You sent yep. me this uh, guy here. Vox Gaia. Get, re get, get ready, because I went with the worst possible race. I took a dwarf. Excellent. <laughs> because... Oh, the elemental hard dwarf. Yes, you better believe it. Elemental oh, I love dwarf. those. So... My thought when I did originally what I wanted to do was make a, a gnome that had the elemental bloodline and was basically obsessed with lightning. And I thought about it and I was like, but wait, I can make a dwarf that explodes once a day. That's way cooler. <laughs> so I made a dwarf who's obsessed with earth. Uh, so Vox Gaia, which means voice of the earth, is an interesting idea. I don't know how good it is. We'll start with that. But I think it's interesting because the way I, I wanted to play it was making this kind of like storyteller dwarf who kind of talks to the other young dwarves and tells them about the dwarven culture and how they grew up and the things they did and all the cool stuff they know and goes into lore uh, and is kind of a storyteller. Uh, so with that, what I actually did was at second level, I took uh, an ancestry or a dedication into Bard. Uh, and went with the Maestro Bard feat and then took several feats to make sure that I was opening up directly into storytelling. So there is a fast, uh, virtuistic performer at second level as a skill feat, uh, which you get to pick a type of performance. Um, and I picked oratory, which is sort of speaking or mm -hmm. telling stories, and you get bonuses to that. Uh, in addition, uh, because you have... Uh, fascinating performance uh which is actually no sorry it's the uh, the bard the basic muse whispers at fourth level we'll get into that but basically you're going to be able to use your performance for diplomacy for deception for intimidation for pretty much everything you're, you're just you're putting everything in performance and you're a, you're a dwarf which just makes it even better because you're just, <laughs> you're just roly-poly dwarf uh that can just do whatever the hell you want through performance it's great um so looking at the ancestry feats to start, so Elemental Heart Dwarves, uh, I believe it's in the character guide. It's either that or the Lost Omens World guide, but I'm pretty sure it's the character guide. 
uh, essentially once a day you can blow up and do uh, what originally sorcerers of the elemental blood type could do in first edition which is essentially do a radial explosion i think it's like a 15 foot radius i want to say i could be wrong look uh, it up yeah i'm looking it up here it is it is a 1d6 damage of your chosen type to all adjacent creatures so it's adjacent so it's a five foot radius essentially um but at third level and every two levels thereafter, it increases by 1d6. So we pick Earth, of course, which is acid damage. So at fifth level, it's 3d6 once a day to everyone near you, um, which is great. It's a fun little thing. Now, the spells, which aren't on this list, and I apologize, uh, they're really what gives it a lot of flavor, and we'll get into that too. Stone Cunning, Rock Runner, uh, basically these are going to make you better at looking at things that are involved with rocks so stone cutting will let you get better perception checks with regards to being in like caves or dealing with rocks or seeing things that are in there so if someone's like carving little things in the stone or the stonework has changed in some way you'd probably get a better check there uh, and rock runner is going to help you avoid difficult terrain from rubble or stone um, so that's always good. This is, again, everything Earth, as much Earth as we can possibly get into this character is what I was going for. <laughs> um, with skill, so fascinating performance is from the background, which is entertainer. Um, and so fascinating performance, just I uh, forget what that one does, but I know it was a fun one, wasn't it? Where was it? Oh, why am I going so fast here? I've got the book open in front of me because I don't, I don't use. I think the, we all do. Yeah. Uh, so basically, <laughs> when you perform, you can compare your result to the will DC of one one observer, and if you succeed, the target's fascinated by you for one round. Um, so fascinated is pretty good. Um, I basically it gives them a bunch of minuses to checks. It's it's it's, it's always good. Uh, if you're an expert in performance, you can fascinate up to four observers. So you can kind of debuff uh, a number of people in the area if you've got a good performance check. And again, with this, you've got four plus your proficiency of expert. So you're talking a plus 13 to your roll, which is pretty good. Uh, it's not no nothing to shake a stick at. Virtuistic performer uh, is a basically just going to make you better at that particular... Oh, where? Uh, one day, one day I'm going to remember how to do... Yeah, so this is actually the one uh, that you're getting that lets you become spectacular or one thing. So you get a plus one circumstance bonus when making a certain type of check. Uh, when you become a master, it becomes plus two, but this is for oratory. So this is storytelling or epics, odes, poetry. So any kind of spoken word performance, you're going to get bonuses there. Uh, and then I took my favorite skill feat, which is dubious knowledge. Uh, the way this works uh, is when you make a recall knowledge check, if you, I believe it's if you fail, if you critically fail or if you fail the check, um, the GM gives you something that is true and something that is blatantly a lie. Uh, so this is awesome because there's been a number of times uh, I've been playing an Age of Ashes campaign. Our fighter has this feat, um, and they've f failed on stuff, and the GM tells them the most out of this world, like it's just enough to believe it's true. Um, kind of stuff and then something that's absolutely true uh, and then one of our other characters will be like that sounds like complete horse crap uh, I don't buy it for a second uh, and they'll make the check and they'll be like yep you find out that Kara and I the fighter is telling a complete lie uh, she doesn't know what the hell she's talking about uh, but th this one thing she said was true because she got that one piece of true knowledge so that's cool. awesome uh, as far as the class feats and abilities so if you're a dwarf, you get dark vision, which is awesome. Uh, it's always a nice thing to have. The energy emanation is the uh, the elemental heart dwarf ability that lets you once a day do that uh, 3d6 of damage, earth or acid damage, in, uh, basically to everyone next to you. Uh, second level. As a quick part... aside, as yep. a quick aside, I just want to say for those who don't have the book, the picture next to the elemental heart dwarf is of a dwarf with like a huge beard but their hair is like all pink and purple and like bright oh, it's blue like every color mm -hmm. yeah it's like <laughs> it's like the cosmic beard of knowledge it's fantastic <laughs> yeah, especially with you taking bard that's exactly how i see you <laughs> i could i could see that absolutely uh so at second level you take bard dedication i think sorcerer kind of suffers from a lot of the early feats are kind of underwhelming yeah um 
Agree. It, it, but with that said, they're very flexible, so it allows you to do things like be a silly sorcerer that goes into Bard. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and we use that because later on we're going to use the Bard's Muse Whispers to get into another another feat, which is... Uh, hold on, my phone's in my pocket somewhere with Path Builder on it. Um, but we're going to do that. But it uh, third level signature spells, those are pretty helpful. I mean, I'm never going to complain about that. Where did I get you? Oh, right. We're going to take Reach spell with that Maestro. So I didn't put any of the spells in. That's fine. I apologize because I right. didn't pay money for for Path Builder. I didn't either. Um, you don't have to to put spells you, in. You don't have to, yeah. Oh, it's just Animal Companions, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's something like that. I think it's pets. I think you got to pay for the pet thing or something. Yeah, yeah. But either uh, way. But, so you're taking Reach spell. And the reason we take Reach is it adds 30 feet or of, of range on any spell that you cast for an action. So basically you can take a two action spell, make it a three action spell, but add 30 feet on it. Which yeah. is great um, for one, touch spells. Yeah, I was just about to say that, um, like on my one I had shopping, Shocking Grasp, and I also had Reach. Right, if it's a touch range spell, it gets a range of 30 feet. So yeah. Shocking Grasp can be awesome. Yeah. Uh, oh, so absolutely. I will add, so we're obviously uh, an elemental sorcerer, and I went with the earth element. So all of the spells that do any kind of damage do bludgeoning damage. And then on top of that, they have the earth trait or the acid trait. I forget which one it is. It's, it's earth or acid. Um, so they're doing it's that. It's just earth in Pathfinder 2nd edition. I don't think they earth. added acid for earth. Yeah, I, I know because in it was in 1st edition. It was like acid equals earth. And electricity is like wind or, or air damage. Um Okay, so with that, your cantrips are pretty basic. I went with Acid Splash for damage, but spells that would be interesting are things like No Direction, which lets you find True North. Uh, That's someone's podcast, North. isn't it? The No Direction <laughs> is a podcast, yeah. yeah. I'm joking around. Uh, Dancing <laughs> Lights or Light, either one is good. I prefer Light because it sticks with the group. Mm -hmm. uh, I love Prestidigitation, so I will never not take it because it's just fun. Uh, but then also read aura and tangle foot because I want to be able to lock people in place. Acid splash is like your cantrip. You're throwing acid at people. It's a good time. Why not? Mm -hmm. For first level, the spell that I want to be the signature spell is shockwave. And, and it's a pretty interesting spell. It doesn't look too strong, but it's just you create a wave of energy. It ripples through the earth and terrestrial, so earthbound creatures in the attempted area, which is a or affected area, which is a 15 foot cone, uh, have to do a reflex save or they stumble. So if they su critically succeed, nothing happens. If they succeed, they are flat footed until the start of its next turn. So once they get their turn, they're on flat footed. If they fail, they fall prone, which makes them flat footed until they stand up. Uh, and if they critically fail, they also take a D6 of damage. And then for every level you heighten it, you get another five feet of range. So with a reach spell, you can get a 40. Uh, I don't know if reach spells work on cones, but if they do, you have a 45 foot cone. But either way, you can keep heightening it uh, and flat footing your enemies is a, a great way to um, just kind of aid your group, especially if you've got rogues oh, yeah. or, or anyone yeah. else in your group that can benefit from that because you get sneak attack damage and your rogues will love it, especially in later levels when you have rogues getting their debilitating strike ability. Uh, if they're attacking flat-footed characters, they're going to make them even worse off uh, doing things where they have weaknesses to certain damage types or uh, they start bleeding or just a number of really cool things that rogues can do through attacking flat-footed enemies. Mm -hmm. um, second level, I, I don't really know how it works, but second level signature spell is, is summon elemental. Um, specifically, you're going to be summoning earth elementals. Uh, you just want to, anytime you can do that, do it summon elementals i know it's in the bestiary you have to look them up uh but summoning can be really effective for flanking or even in some rp scenarios uh because i've I, for example a great thing we once did is we had a, a fuse we had to put out no one could reach it um and i summoned an earth a water elemental onto it in first edition to put out the fuse because the water elemental could just sit on top of it uh, and put it out really easily. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a great way to make use of that spell. So summoning creatures, specifically elementals, can have a lot of really powerful effects. 
Um, that said, I would love to focus on just earth elementals and things of that nature or other earth kind of creatures like moles or badgers. Uh, I, I guess maybe you could sneak like a cave bear in there if you get high enough, but this is some elemental, so it's just going to be elementals. Um, there are some pretty nasty ones, though, in, in the bestiary, from what I understand. And then in uh, third level, you get Fireball. Uh, that's kind of going to be the, 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 the favored spell, the signature spell. Um, just because there's, no, I, I imagine as an Earth Sorcerer, uh, you're going to not be throwing a Fireball, but just like a huge boulder at people that explodes out uh, and just sends shrapnel and rocks everywhere and hits them. But you also want to take spells like Earthbind, where you can grab flying creatures and just yank them down to the ground, which I think is always fun. Um, dealing with flying creatures can be a real pain in the butt. Uh, the fun part about Earthbind is that uh, if you... Gra and it's a fort save, and a lot of smaller flying creatures don't usually have really good fort saves. Uh, but if you do, and they fail the saves, it can't fly, levitate, or otherwise leave the ground for a round. Uh, and if you they critically fail, they can't leave for a minute. So they're stuck on the ground, and your team can just jump on them and beat the crap out of them. They don't take fall damage, unfortunately, but uh, that's up to 120 feet, and the range is 120 feet. So I guess if someone's 150 feet, you can reach spell them and grab them out, and they take 30 feet fall damage because they don't fall safely for the last uh, 30 feet there. Um, I would also mention uh, Meld into Stone is a great spell because you can just walk through walls. Uh, that are made of stone, and it's it's always an interesting thing to do. So that's pretty much the whole character. Cool. I went into it because a, a great point my first edition GM made to me when he did the playtest stuff at conventions um, was that it didn't feel like you needed to have an 18 in your key st your key stat at level one. Uh, they actually made a group of goblins to test out, and he played a goblin cleric with a 16 in wisdom, and he still felt like he could get away with you know being effective in the group and the, the entire group took goblin scuttle as one of their feats so that it could all <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> it, it, such they, a good were, they were telling me about it I, it felt a little dirty just reading it when i finally got the rule book and i was like this is this is dirty <laughs> um but i think it's it, you know a lot of people get you know you build your first character and you go oh, I, you know, I want to build, like, a fighter, so I really want to have high constitution, so uh, I can't take elf. Uh, and I think a lot of people should, you know, you should look at it and say, you know what, yeah, I can build an elf. Uh, maybe I'd need to use that free bonus to get rid of that constitution penalty, but you're still getting dex, you're getting int, and then you can build out from there. Because that it, it, level 20, it, once you've gotten all your ability boosts, we're talking about a minus one, basically, on your on your rolls related to charisma in this case. Which, it, you know, it can matter. I agree, it absolutely can. But in the long run of things, it's it's not going to kill you. And you can still have a lot of fun. And, and you can really RP uh, a goofy dwarf who goes around being a bard and helping out your party that way. And telling big stories. And bursting oh, yeah. in, bursting into flames at will. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Uh, I, 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 oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just to clear up something that you mentioned earlier about cone spells it would be widen spell to increase the range oh that's right and you could do that too probably you could, you could take either i believe widen and reach are both available they are yeah, yeah. so you could do either one that's that's one, one thing i noticed when i was just first learning the system is the you know heal and well how many actions do you want to spend for it do you want to just do a single target do you want to do someone at range or whatever effect i mean that kind of flexibility is much more tactical it's a word i say a lot but it's just choices as opposed to being like mass heal and then heal and then, you know, cure light wounds and cure serious wounds and cure critical wounds and all that kind of stuff for the old days. And I, I love the ability, oh. put it in the hand of the player, let him decide how to channel it or whatever he wants to do. So those kinds of things are day, wonderful. Yeah. The, the day or the, the, the session, my bard at first, first edition got soothing performance was the, like our party suddenly realized we can take damage in combat because Kermosis will just heal us back up because he gets a bunch of free castings of cure serious wounds, mass cure serious wounds every day. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> and I finally used all my bardic performance in one day, and I was like, "Holy crap! I finally did it." <laughs> That's crazy. So, uh, any other com questions or comments on uh, Vox Gaia? I just can't stop imagining him coming to his hometown every once in a while, like a dozen kids gathering around him <laughs> that all insist on calling him Grandpa Boulder. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
you know, honestly, you could play play uh, the character as a woman too. I don't, I don't necessarily think it has to be a guy. It could be an Irish mother. It could be an Irish mother. Whatever flavor yeah. you want. <laughs> Um, what I do, I want so badly at fifth level, I would absolutely make elemental form the signature spell. Um, it, it only heightens at sixth level and seventh level, but I would just imagine, you know, this, this small roly poly dwarf turning into this enormous earth elemental and just pounding the crap out of enemies and really giving them what's, what's good. So I, I love the elemental form. I love those kinds of spells. Cause I always imagine like a little gnome turning into this huge, like air elemental and firing lightning bolts at people. Well, he's just huffing and puffing in the back, trying to keep up. So like, hang on a second, yeah. wait for him to catch up to us. And then uh, he, there he's here and then you can start, okay, what are we going to do? So it's a great yeah, character. The original concept very strong. Was, an, was an earth elemental sorcerer that just wanted to be the fastest thing alive that was supposed to focus on lightning and speed boosts. So the signature spell or the spell at first level would be fleet step. So for one minute, mm-hmm. they can move at 70 foot speed. <laughs> wow, that's far. So yeah. <laughs> 210 feet in six seconds. There's not tables big enough. <laughs> Hold on. Let's, let's just do in the math. So 210 feet in six seconds to miles per hour conversion um, uh, would be 143 miles per hour. No, that's that's per second. That's not. So divided by six. What's, oh, God. It would be... Just tuck into a cannonball and 35. slam into somebody. So 35 feet per second would be 23 miles per hour, something like that. Probably, probably. That's cool. He's nutty. I love the uh, I love these creative characters that aren't power gamer characters. You know, I've been around the, as a video game guy. I'm around that all the time. We make these video games, and I'm a big MMO player too. And it's just always, what's the best build for this and best build for that? And that's the thing about the role playing tabletop games. It's hopefully can reinvigorate people to shift away from that. And come create something that's got a personality, like a character from a book or a film. Yeah. The, the we also talk I... about. <laughs> can we also talk about how, as like a sorcerer, and then also as a bard, you are talking about telling all these stories and like telling the history of your people, and then you've got a ten intelligence and a twelve wisdom. There we go. Like, I feel like <laughs> at some point you'll get the details incorrect. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And that's, that's half the fun, right? It will still uh, be a great story. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, just as a comment on the sort of the power power gaming, there's nothing really wrong with that. No, nothing that. wrong with it. It's just, uh, but yeah. uh, the the guys I play Age of Ashes with are all fifth edition guys, and they basically have said that they feel like in fifth edition, if you make a mistake with your character, if you don't, uh, you know, if you don't pick the right race or take the right spells or the right feats, that your character is mm-hmm. basically just dead from that point. Like they're not really worth playing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in, fifth, in D&D 2nd Edition, you, n- there, there are definitely optimal builds, but there are, you can still play a character like a goofy dwarf sorcerer or a dwarven bard and take that, that flaw in charisma and still actually have a good functional character that, that is able to keep up all the way to level 20. Yeah, and I think that's something, you know, someone who doesn't know what they're looking at, that they look at the max hit points of 60 for you, and Kaz's hit points are like 41, and and Zarak, your was, let's go to your first page here, it's like 53, and we got a 44 and a 48 in here, and I think the the girl I put together is like 48, the... uh, you can't just base it on AC, and this is all unarmed people. You know, 20, 21, 20, 19, 20, and they're not wearing anything, all right? They have nothing, and but they're all completely different completely different animals. There's only The only real difference in the health, of, this is just level 5 characters. It's not much of a gap. And, you know, the dwarf is, well, that constitution, that's why he's getting that extra health. If he wasn't a dwarf, he wouldn't have that high of a number for his hit points. But yeah, another, he's not a nuking machine either, right? He's not walking in the front door and just burning everything to the ground. He's doing all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, another thought would go would be going monk for a dedication uh, and getting the first level <laughs> feet and picking up mountain stance and not worrying about decks, but you get that plus four uh, uh, to your armor class from that stance. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and using that. And, ba- you know, I think if you really wanted to be a melee fighter, you'd go monk with a sorcerer dedication. Mm-hmm. Uh, but doing it the other way around, it still works. Cause then you get all those kind of that spell uh, functionality that you'd want. Uh, and you can pick up the feats that you want from monk as you go along the way. Cause again, sorcerer feats are, th- they're not very exciting in some cases. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, Sarek has got he's got to run. Um, I can. I, thanks for coming out, man, and sharing your cool build with us. It was really neat. And uh, we'll figure out another time we can all get together again and do something. But uh, yeah, I'll stick this on YouTube when we get done. I, we, I'm going to go through my uh, strange girl, and y'all can give me some tips on what we've done wrong with her. How about that next? But uh, you guys, take a moment and say cheers to Sarek for coming tonight, and uh, you know, sharing. The hobgoblin design. I thought he was an awesome character. Oh, yeah. All right. Cheers, man. Thanks for joining us. So, uh, can I go next? Yeah. Last. Last but not least. Sure. But not least. There we go. So, um, theming. On this character, <clears throat> every time I've ever played every AD&D game or d and I'm always playing humans. It's always been that way. I've been so narrow-minded with it. The power of all the athletics moves, to me... I'm such a tactical close range MMA fan type of a person that I love the shove. I love the disarm. I love the trip. And I think, you know, can you build a sorcerer that has in the fight that's doing crowd control and doing some damage and has reach and fast movement. But if anyone gets in your face, you can use these other abilities to get them off you like trip and stuff like that. So I didn't, so I tried, I, I said, it looks ridiculous, but I said, I'm going to sacrifice some charisma to give her high strength. So, and she's a martial discipline for athletics. So all of her stuff is all oriented around being able to defend herself. <laughs> uh, and, and if anyone gets in her face, so the skilled heritage, natural skill, general training, all those basic kind of things. But then we're going Titan wrestler, right? So that means you'll be able to do things to people that are larger than you. So I thought that'd be kind of crazy, but she's divine. So she's really playing this kind of pickup healer that can personally protect herself, which sounds a little ridiculous, but then, and she, but she's using reach spells and heals and doing some uh, darkness and blindness. I'm going to kind of rush through mine really quickly so you guys can pick it apart. So she's the bloodline angelic because I wanted to intentionally pick stuff that was self-preservation and healing the group oriented. And I also wanted just to pick a couple of crowd control range damage, but I didn't want to stay in the back and start throwing divine lance all day long. Right. I didn't want to, I didn't want to play a sorcerer that played like a typical nuker. And one of the things from the last show, when we were talking about tripping, I was like, you know, I've never really learned that. Let me dig into that. So that's why all these athletic skills to me are, they're just on demand, use them. They're one action. They look fantastic, especially the disarm and the trip and the shove. And you also get some other fun things that was too, like quick jump. So battle medicine, we talked about that earlier tonight. Titan wrestler would be neat. Someone gets in her face because she's got a lot of strength. So that was my kind of approach to her. And now we're not talking about someone that's supposed to be like an Amazon or anything, but uh, and it could be a guy character. It doesn't matter about the sex to me, but I wanted to see how that would pan out um, from the perspective of being a sorcerer that can assist with healing nearby. But at the same time, if you try to get in her face, she either outrun you or she'll disable you and then continue to get away from you. And then if you switch targets off of her, then she can go back to helping the group or she can start doing nasty damage to you. Now, the personality of the character, I didn't put as much time and energy that because I'm still learning. I don't have the, the level of table time that you guys do. I haven't gotten the chance to go, let me design a character like I do writing in the book. So I'm just going to jump ahead to spell selection and get some feedback from you guys on this. So with her being divine, I'm picking things like a uh, message where we're having situations where we're in an environment where I can whisper something in someone's ear along the, playing up to the charisma to say, hey, let's go ahead and go check on this. And the, if there's a bunch of guards or something that further away, they might go be convinced to go, hey, let's, this guy told me to go do this. We're all going to walk off and they all get separated. Um, shield is just to help you stabilize, to help a teammate, light to make something glow. Days, real boring, old school, third edition stuff. The days would be something I'd be, I, as you can see, my cantrips aren't just, slam nuking people i'm not in the back doing those kinds of things in a fight uh, we have things like command and fear uh, for let's control the crowd right i wanted to be in the middle lines the back lines and helping control the crowd i didn't need all the glory to try to smash something down myself and then healing the one that's in trouble by having a high movement so i can get in and get back out now when it comes time to really lay down some hurt on people Unfortunately, like the Hobgoblin, who's got the natural dark vision, um, I could cast dark vision on myself, and then I could cast darkness. And then I'm thinking, let's just pop a spiritual weapon into that darkness, start beating the crap of him because it doesn't need to see anything. Or I could start doing vampiric touch on someone that's stuck inside the darkness if someone else has crowd controlled their movement. So that's a complex series of two rounds for it to really be a payoff. That would only be something I would probably try to do if things are going really bad and people are bunched up 
and maybe there's a melee fighter in the front or uh, people aren't spread all over the place and we got a lot of enemies coming in the room. Um, but I picked up some other little things like Crisis of Faith. Uh, the mechanic of the sorcerer, the signature spell, I don't think I've got that down yet. I'm still learning that. I haven't got that totally figured out right. So I tried building some path builder and researched the spells. So that was kind of the idea behind her is an athletics oriented uh, sorcerer that is really acting as a healer, but has some uh, high mobility, high movement speed, but has a couple really nasty little tricks you can do when there's a big battle. Um, not someone who's just going to single target, nuke someone down or anything like that. And as you can hear, I'm talking in kind of like video game modes, right? Because a lot of things I always talk about come from my background of, of doing and playing these kinds of games. Because when we play AD&D, we're always having to do that to stay alive because we're being killed all the time. So that was kind of her loose, rough idea for her. Because I've never really have ever played a, a sorcerer in Pathfinder or a 3.5 ever. And I always stayed away from the charisma oriented spontaneous casters. So... I don't know. Give me your harsh feedback, your tips, your advice. I'd love to learn from what you guys think about something like that. Does that sound kind of silly or is it viable or does she need to pick different spells? I don't know. What do you think? I'd love, I'd love to hear the feedback. I like that you didn't, I mean, you didn't feel the need to go uh, an 18 in charisma. Um, but what I'm, I mean, why, why did you decide not to give the uh, bonuses you get at fifth level to, uh, to charisma and strength and or, or did you I guess sure I'm just where did you start out with yeah so I you know this is kind of weird this is some of my older sensibilities like I need to have a little bit higher dexterity a little bit higher constitution because I didn't think I was going to be tasking a lot of spells with a high I'm getting plus three at least already for the charisma so uh, do I really need to have 18 to get just one more plus one when I'm not casting stuff that's going to directly damage someone or do something to someone. Did you, so maybe those are bad choices. I don't know. I, I'll take the criticism. It doesn't matter to me at all. But uh, so in my mind, I was thinking I need to get the AC up just a touch um, to get her to close to 20 is what I was trying to do for the dexterity. The strength obviously is so I can play into athletics. Does that sure. make any sense? Yeah. I do like yeah. that. You also got a long spear because reach is just amazing. Yeah. That's why I picked it and, it doesn't mean you have a hand free, which you're going to need to do to do half of those athletics type things. But I, I want to keep people off of her. Like if someone tries to rush her, I, my goal is to keep people off of her. And there's actually intimidation. And, and there's one of the things in the build that, where she can shout out things at people in the high levels of intimidation. Um, I forgot what the specific ability was. There's a thing you can do in intimidation where you can yell at someone and tell them to stop rushing and things like that. Do you guys remember what that is? I can't remember off the top of my head. It's see if it's under the skills here or not. There is one of the... Uh, I can't find it now. Where is it? There was one of the things in the abilities. If you take intimidation really high, one of the things you can do with it is you can yell out things to people to make them to debuff them in a way. Does that make sense? Oh, well, yeah. Well, there's intimidation. Um, it's it's uh, demoralizing. That's what someone. it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just a base ability of being a... Uh, being a um, uh, they're using intimidation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a real noobish kind of character <laughs> idea. So I don't know. What do you guys think about the viability of putting so much emphasis into athletics for for protecting yourself and uh, using a spear as opposed to, um, you know, there's not a lot of personality in the character. I'd have to flush that later. Do you think that's ridiculous or silly? Who, or? I think someone who would be coming from like either 3.5 or Pathfinder 1st Edition would find it weak just by looking at it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the nice thing about Pathfinder 2nd Edition is that even though your charisma is a little bit lower than an 18, even though your strength is higher than what people would expect, um, you don't have to go into the two builds that use strength for a sorcerer to be able to be effective in combat. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you have a decent AC, you have a good strength score, you'll be able to hit things. And so the only thing that's going to happen is, well, okay, so if I don't have a bunch of spells or if I don't find a use for a bunch of these spells, I can cast heal 11 times um, and hit people with you know, a long spear. So at the end of the day, you'll still be happy with that character based on what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the idea was to don't get... Don't get swarmed. So, I don't know. I'd like to hear what other feedback. What, do you, what else do you guys think? Um, well, I personally think it's, it's completely viable um, as, a, as a Pathfinder 2nd Edition character. 
Um, and it's, it's very interesting, like, what you've shown there is the fact that even though you are a sorcerer, you don't necessarily have to be that glass cannon in the distance. You can be on the front lines, you can be, you know, mixing it up with your fighters and your champions, um, and providing support to the rest of your team. You don't have to be somebody who isn't, um, you know, getting mixed in with, with those melee weapons, but at the same time, obviously, you know, you've given her the, the long spear for the reach, so maybe, you know, the, the fighter and the champion are uh, just, you know, only just in front of you, and, and you're, you know, stabbing at the enemy um, from behind them, um, and then obviously supporting them with your magic. And then if they turn and try to focus on her or get in her face, she would use all her, you know, shove, disarm, trip yeah. type. That would be that my idea was like, I wanted to shove, disarm, and trip to be at her disposal and then leaping the quick jump to get out of the range. Like if anyone tries to close the gap on her that she could get out of there when she, when it's her turn, when it's her turn to do something, instead of you, you could cast a spell and try to help the team out, cast a heal, and then you want to actually just to shove someone 10, 10 feet back and it probably wouldn't miss. That was the oh, thing well, I was definitely. thinking. I mean, not with an 18, um, she's going to succeed at those things. Yeah, and especially with stuff like trip you can you know set it up for for those teammates martially inclined or even even a rogue um you know setting it up so that they can then you know fall back a bit and support you while you're getting out of there have you guys seen people use disarm much on your table a little bit whatever uh, yeah the the, <laughs> the individual uh in my group who plays a fighter because they took the duelist dedication um they focus a lot now on the combat maneuvers. So mm -hmm. they have used disarm uh, because we are fighting a lot of like human opponents, like cultists wielding weapons. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how effective it's been, uh, especially because when we talk about like trip, like, disarming someone, if it's not a critical success, it doesn't do anything really. Mm -hmm. um, it, if you do it two times in a row as a success, then they're disarmed. Mm -hmm. uh, but you really need to get that critical success for it to be worth it. And then if you're if you're tripping someone, they're prone, they're flat-footed, they have to stand up. You're a fighter, so you're getting an attack of opportunity. Um, tripping, grabbing, shoving, all of those things are incredibly effective uh, for as compared to disarming someone. Yeah, and since I'm not, you know, they're just actions. There's no cost associated with it. All those spells are in the back pocket, and with the high movement speed disengaging and getting far away and then not just to save yourself but just you know, forget the front line monkey business i was thinking about setting up some kill for a rogue someone's hurt in the back you know there's a caster comes on the field they're going to get silenced or we can start doing you know someone's wounded and hurt and stabilized but if someone encroaches on me i can just turn around and push them away from me so i wanted to have that kind of like martial fighter mma fighter kind of a vibe but really be about what they really do is this like more self preservation, but from the skill side as opposed to the spell side. And then the spells can be used to help the team or, you know, do a little bit of crowd control because all none of the spells at all are, are like, I mean, they're searing light. Yes. And vampiric touch. Those are nasty, but all the other ones are more just, you know, crowd control type things. They aren't really designed to just destroy something by yourself. Yeah, and I think this is probably a good time to talk about the role of armor when we're talking about being on the front lines. Because in older versions of Pathfinder and D&D, the difference between someone who's not wearing armor and someone who's wearing heavy armor is the difference between someone who's alive and someone who's dead. Um, but in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, you're looking at light armor adding a plus one, usually medium a plus two, and heavy a plus three. And so you're talking about a bonus that can bring you up to a pseudo higher level of proficiency or the armor class of someone who's a higher level. And so when you're talking about the difference between like, you know, having someone who's a heavy armored and someone, a sorcerer who's running in without any armor, depending on how you build it, the difference can be a lot less than I think what people would expect if they've never picked up Pathfinder 2nd Edition. That's a good point. And the other thing I think is the saving throws. Uh, with, the, with the decks, they're getting the extra three for the reflex. So you got a plus 10 there, plus 10 on the will, and plus 11 on fortitude, even though there's no real constitution. Because um, she's ex the expert uh, level on the fortitude. So 
if you're going to try and do something to her, um, just a lot of, you know, a lot of defense happening there to some degree. I don't know. You'll see the differences this, this between is a very classes. Durable character, so. Yeah, you'll see the differences in classes over time, over levels, because a lot of the time you will get that expert level fortitude, but you might get it a little bit later than another class who's more martial focused. Yep. And that's what you'll see the differences are, because we get a lot of things. We'll get higher levels of proficiency with unarmored defense, um, but we aren't going to get up to like legendary with robes. Like not mm -hmm. everybody's going to be able to do that. And that's going to differentiate you between other classes that might be able to have more defense. Yeah, and this is I, just I, I, a straight up sorcerer too. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I would mention from just like a game design perspective, um, the fact that there's so much being done where certain characters don't have uh, like access to specific feats, um, it's really good because, or certain abilities, because later on they can add archetypes like they did with uh, Carnival, uh, what is it, Extinction Curse, where any class can get an animal companion. Or, or they do it where yes. any class can get, with champion dedication, access to heavy armor. And that's really awesome, I think. Um, it's just one of the coolest parts uh, that they've done, really. Um, so and I to add to like that, that, yeah, to add to that, the Advanced Player's Guide, I don't know if it's coming on the Advanced Player's Guide, but they have a plan to make Cavalier and Vigilante a multi-class archetype rather than its own class to kind of build on your opportunity to build a character your way. Nice. Cool. Well, that's my first yeah. attempt at a wacky sorcerer. <laughs> I have to say that I love you guys' builds that you came up with, Knight. They're uh, really cool, really creative, and show a lot more savvy for the rules than mine. But uh, I learned a lot just from listening to you guys tell me all your choices and why you made them tonight, which is I hope that people that watch the videos pick up on that, too. It's OK not to know everything. Go in there and dabble with the characters and try to learn it. Like with the one character I'm doing, I'm hyper focusing on skill usage like that strength yeah, yeah. is just for skill usage. It's not for anything else. Go ahead. But the, the, the thing is, even though you've done that, they're not terrible at being a sorcerer. And they're not a terrible character. They are just as good um, as everybody else, even though you haven't exactly picked um, what people might consider more optimal choices. Yeah, certainly not optimal. <laughs> I mean, the only thing you could do to make your whole tripping thing better would be to use a weapon with a trip trait. Yeah, like a sickle yeah. or something. Like, um, yeah. But you're, you're not a... I mean, I, I, you're not any really worse at it than a fighter would be with 18 strength. So I would argue a trip weapon might not necessarily do much um, because it just uses your attack modifier in place. Well, and here you've that's got a plus true. 11. And you're that's with, true. And yeah, long spear is simple. And it's a simple yeah. weapon. So I don't have, it's almost yeah. free. And of course, like everyone else is all saying, if yeah. you really have to sit in the back and just pop the hand crossbow, you can do that all that. I wouldn't want to do that anyway. But uh, yeah. But, I only took a dagger. Like, yeah. This I guy, you know, I'm I'm not looking at, you know, if I were playing that character, the the dagger would be the absolute worst case scenario for him. Oh yeah. I, I, in terms of weapons, I think that are really great. I think the glaive is amazing. Um, slashing. It, it, it's yeah. A, yeah, it's a D8. It's slashing. It has reach as a pole arm. I believe it's also forceful, so it it, it gets that going. Um, so, and it's excellent if you're a gnome because by taking gnome weapon familiarity, you get access to it right away. Um, the other one is the kukri because it's 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 got so much. I think it's like an agile finesse weapon. It's it's deadly. It's got a lot going for it, and it's just like the best dagger. If you're building a little uh, a stabby rogue, <laughs> no, it's it's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a good time. Cool. All right. Well, this is a long one tonight. You guys still have any energy? I was going to wrap things up here and. Do some family stuff. Is that cool with you fellas? Yeah, go. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, cool. With me. Do y'all want to set some come goals or loose ideas for maybe the next time we get together? Or you want to just let let it sink in for the weekend, maybe chat next week? What would you guys like to do? I don't even really know. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I love the honest answer. Probably gonna be doing kid stuff and it's passover so happy passover for everyone well maybe sometime uh, next we'll... week or something uh we can do something we can throw ideas in the channel here and share them and and uh this one's long Man. i want to see 
I learned a lot. I had a lot of fun, actually. And I uh, hope the people that watch it, even though it's a long video, it's still fun. Um, maybe the next time we'll find a more specific question that we're seeing pop up in Facebook groups or whatever, and you guys can all field the question. I don't know. I'm, I'd like to help other people is the big goal yeah, exactly. of this stuff. Oh, I would love a Q&A. A Q&A would be so much fun. But yeah. why don't we do something like that? Yeah, why don't we just do a Q&A? Think about how we could structure it and work it out. We could, everyone could bring to the table like, hey, I saw these two questions. And then throw it to the group, and then the group can answer it. I don't know. Yeah, no, I'd be up for that. Cool. All right. Well, if you want anyone to get punched in the face, you just call my sorcerer up, and uh, <laughs> the <laughs> goblin can tell all the lies, and we got the, the, the lizard guys that are going to blend in in beautiful colors along the way. So it would be a, a, an interesting group to come marching down the street. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I would love to do a session with just all these sources. We should okay. do it for fun sometime. Oh, my gosh. And, and then you got the forlorn guy in the back who's like, oh. yeah. <laughs> he's like, I don't really care. I see you guys are all dead anyway. And, uh, you know, pretty much. That'd, pretty, that'd be pretty be a viable group, though. The hobgoblin oh, yeah. would hate me. <laughs> that should be funny. Especially with, the, especially with the characters where you got the bard dedication and, and, the, and the ranger dedication as well. I actually it would be very funny to try to play these kids. I don't know. Maybe it's something else we could think about sometime. But we, why don't we Possibly. think think about a Q and A, and then if someone wants to run something sometime, we could always do that. We don't have to stream it, and whatever you wanted to do. My goal is to kind of like keep evangelizing the game, break barriers for people not who haven't learned it and haven't given it a shot yet. I can't tell you how many people that play Fifth Edition that don't give this game a chance because it is a little complex if you and even i haven't learned it yet and i'm learning from you guys too so but yeah let's do something fun i'd love to play I, these characters I i'm like saving it's a them. different mindset from from fifth edition oh yeah definitely it, it, it's just you know and that was one of my first comments on the forums where a lot of people were like when am i going to get this thing that i could play in pathfinder first edition and i was like well, why don't you just keep playing first edition you know mm. I, like, I was, why can't second yeah. edition be this new organic thing that sort of develops, you know, the way it's going to, as opposed to when are we getting guns in Pathfinder second oh edition? Oh my God, that happened the first week. <laughs> the, politics, the, the, the first, the first week they game, wanted to play Twilight uh, Two Thousand or something. It's like uh, that was hilarious. Yeah. Whereas right. for 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 me, um, you know, I did three point five. I then did loads of sort of like indie RPGs after that. Then went on to fifth edition. Um, I played a bit of first edition Pathfinder, but that was quite a uh, like early on in Pathfinder's life for for first edition. So it was more sort of you know similar to three point five in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I had all my three point five stuff, I didn't actually really do anything with first edition Pathfinder. And then I heard that second edition was coming out and checked out the play test. Um, and to me, it was just the perfect sort of melding between. Um, what 5e was doing right and everything that it was missing from 3.5 just sort of in this melting pot that exactly. we have now hero, just, yeah. we hero just found book. that uh, 5e was just getting very very samey you know yeah. there's no it, it's yeah. so flat you know I it's hear that compared to 3.5 <laughs> And it's it's good for it's good for new people, but you know, I'm just looking at it, and we just kind of got to the point where we're like, it's just just boring. You choose your class, and then you almost never make another choice, and it's it's just. Ugh. I mean, even in in first edition Pathfinder, I feel like that's very much the issue. Um, but the the number one thing for me is the changes to the action economy, because oh, playing second yes. edition. I got slowed, and oh my god, it was awe. It was just the worst experience of my entire <laughs> life. Because it was just, well, you get you, your champion gets two actions now. And I'm like, I just, I just want to take, oh, I just want to take a third action. I want to be able to stride, stride, strike. And it's like, nope, you're not allowed to do that. You get a stride and a strike. Base, and all it was, and now I go back to playing first edition, and I was just like, this is terrible. How did I ever do this? And I'm like, all right, yeah. I'm a first edition bard. I just cast haste and good hope, and then I inspire courage, and I'm good to go. Like that's it. Yeah, I think that's. I, I think they need that hero book. <laughs> you feel you feel like you're hot king. You know what I mean? Like. Oh yeah. You just do the same I thing over and over again. You know. Absolutely love the fact that they took away attack of opportunity just being universal. Oh. 
Absolutely. Oh, yeah, people are getting the stuck numbers. up. They're getting all clustered yeah. and stuck and una- unwilling to move you, five you, feet. You what? Yeah. <laughs> you weren't you weren't slugging it. You're not slugging it out anymore. Not a feel of oh, I have to just stand here. Yeah, that's like well, EverQuest one make... stuff. <laughs> well, it gives it more options, makes... and it even it, makes it even makes your character really your sorcerer. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, it makes your character your sorcerer that you strength a lot um, much more viable because if you need to cast a spell and you're locked in melee with someone, you're not always going to get hit with an ha- attack of opportunity when you cast a spell. So they have so many more options for being able to cast in melee now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, we'll call it a night there. Does that sound cool? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, and I appreciate you guys putting time and energy to this and coming and hanging out and uh, come with these cool builds. I love it. We need to get someone to draw some pictures for these characters. I think they're going to be a ragtag team that dominates the world one day. <laughs> I, I will it. say... It'd, It'd be fun, actually. To me, is just like one of the best ones because it's you just anyone can get any kind of spellcasting tradition they want. Um, mm-hmm. But that said, generally, if you want, like if you want feats, if you're going for specific feats and not just spellcasting, you can go for the other ones and go for you know bard, cleric, yeah, wizard or druid. Yeah, druid I think actually has the weakest dedication. I think they give very little uh, out of that dedication. Yeah. Well, maybe we should play some, too. Who knows? We can make time for it. But I, I like being able to have the knowledge sharing, too, because there's so many people that already show them playing the game. And uh, the knowledge yeah. on at this group, I mean, what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six people. And there's so much table time and life experiences that for, if I was watching a video and I could hear some real players kind of just talk about it and hear what they say and correcting each other on things that are wrong or making suggestions, like, wait a minute, you did it with that what with your character? I think it really helps kind of reveal the magic hidden in the sand that no one else has found yet. <laughs> so um, I think that would be, hopefully that will help people, you know, see what's cool in the game and building the characters. One of the best ways to do it. They, they really need to, they really need to do a website for character building. In my personal opinion, they need to make a hero book so people can see pictures and um, get an idea of what they can build and just pull a cool hero out of a book ready to go besides the ensemble cast the ensemble cast is always going to be there on the materials and all the they're the heroes of the brand you know but uh yeah anyway i'll keep talking i'll never stop dude (laughs) 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 that's my biggest problem (laughs) i totally agree with you there though because like you know as as much as they they have the iconics um the iconics at this point in with what pathfinder second edition can do and then and you know what we've shown here um the iconics are very much more traditional versions of those classes compared to what you can actually make and i think the other thing that's really interesting is that when you guys presented your ideas tonight you're also telling us how you play them so even if you had a one page guide with a picture of the character and here's the stats and here's the you know here's all these different abilities they can do like the lie and all this kind of stuff that the hobgoblin character can do right let me pull him up again Mm. real quick all the different, the Charming Liar and Lie to Me and So Rumor. And then you can even have a written blurb because there's such great writers over there to say, like, when you play this character, he really excels at doing this. For example, here's some things you could do. And that, you know, sometimes I think if a player is given that, it's kind of like when you watch a movie, you can tell, a kid can tell what the character does in the movie. Oh, this is Iron Man. This is Gypsy Danger. This is what they do, right? So yeah. having that hero book with page one being all the stats you need to print up and go play in your game session and page two, like how to play and here's some neat tricks you can do and here's some combinations. I That might reveal some of this neat personality that's in the game that a fifth edition player is right now hyper-focusing on voice acting. You know what I mean? As opposed to express yeah. themselves creatively. So Yeah, and it's... Yeah. It's all about that synergy. Um, what what you find yourself doing when you're building a character in second edition is, you know, whether you're doing it from you know wanting it to work mechanically or doing it for your character, it's very much looking for that synergy. What works well with what and makes sense for the for for your like aim for that character, mm-hmm. um, rather than just uh, oh well, he's a, a sorcerer, so he does this. Um, agree 100 percent yeah as far as voice acting and rping the best rp i've ever played with 
I haven't played with many, but even seeing, like, watching is this guy who plays the Druid in my Age of Ashes campaign, because all he did, he's playing a Leshy Druid, all he did is give his character a stutter. And every once in a while, he'll, oh, we need to, to, to go here. And, it, and it's, like, perfect. He does it <laughs> so well. And I, I think he deserves so much credit for doing it. Because it, it just, like, it is really well, You should awesome. call his name out right here on the internet. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he, you'll know who exactly who it is. Yeah. Um, because we play through Discord. But it, it's awesome. And, and asking people about RP advice, it's really not the voice. It's how your character would act in yeah. specific <laughs> situations and, and things like that. Yeah, some of the yeah, best novels, yeah. the best writers, they don't ever voice act. They just write it and imagine it and describe it and tell it and show yeah. it. You don't have to be an actor from the Screen Actors Guild to be a, to have a lot of fun bringing life to your character on the table. Exactly. Like um, I had one of my players uh, approach me with with that particular like issue of uh, play better, um, and it was that thing of I was like, well, you you don't have to you know be your character first person you, you you can you can say oh well my character's going to do this and say it like this and and do it more like you are you know the writer of, of the book and then what that character's doing in that particular moment than being the character themselves um and that that helped them a lot with with contributing more because instead of trying to you know voice their character the character would be voiced or say it as the character would say it would be oh well my character you know is, is trying to convey this um and then the rest of us could just imagine how that character would say it rather than the player having to you know self-consciously try and think of the right words yeah there's a quote from stephen king that's like that it's like you know the, the words appear on the page but the idea is crystallized in somebody's mind i think in one of his books on writing he has a description of like there's a white rabbit with the blue ink dye number eight on its back and then you're like, from there, what is that? What does that mean? Is it a little kid race on Easter day or is it a laboratory animal? I mean, what's going on? So I think you need to leave the imagination. I think sometimes all the critical role and other stuff, not criticizing it, a lot that if you try to voice act it, there's nothing left for the other players at the table to read in to the personality of your character. You know, and I think that's something that, uh, and your character can change and evolve. You know, how you feel one day versus the next day. You may not be in the mood to go play because you don't feel like the energy it takes to pretend you're this drunkard yeah. Irish dwarven guy, you know, or whatever it is that people are doing. So I, that's the thing about Pathfinder 2, uh, looping it back in. is like we create characters like you wouldn't even know how they would possibly speak. What would they sound like? <laughs> but you mm. can see them in your mind. And even without a concept art or a sketch today, every single one of these characters has really depth and personality. Just can't stay in a voice, so I end up dropping in and out of it. So then I just don't do it. Yeah, I don't do it. Oh. I'd never do it. <laughs> I suffer so much with that when I'm doing NPCs. They'll start off with one voice, and at the end, they'll they'll have a completely different one. Yeah. Or uh, or or I'll often suffer with them sounding exactly the same. Yeah, the one <laughs> accent that you're good at doing. Yeah. <laughs> like every dwarf has to be Scottish. Is that it? Uh, not necessarily, um, but although oh. I do suffer from every barman has to have a gruff voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I'm going to close it down there. Y'all have a wonderful weekend. Have a lot of fun, and we'll just communicate whatever through Discord and throw some ideas out, and we'll figure out what we do next. No, no pressure. We we'll have to commit to a time, and we'll just roll with it. How's that sound? Sounds good. Sounds good. good. And thanks so much for putting your time and energy to help make this cool, and hope it makes it uh, brings a lot of fun to people. You're Always welcome. a pleasure. All right, thank yep. you. It's like, and all right, we'll talk to you soon. You'll have a fun weekend. Stay safe. Yep. You too. Later.